All right, at ease. Everybody listen up. First off, need you to do something for me. Go to streetwarriorradio.com. Do your Amazon shopping through there. I know you're going to shop on Amazon. I know it. You know how I know it? Because Amazon is worth $1.6 trillion. That's a fake. That's a fake number. That's fake news. But Amazon is worth a lot. You know why they're worth a lot? Because everyone shops on Amazon. You do your Amazon Prime. Your kids got Kindles. You got a Kindle. You get your book there. You get your groceries there. Everybody goes to Amazon Prime. So what I need you to do is tighten up. Go to streetwarriorradio.com. Click the Amazon click through. Do your shopping. Nothing else. Put your info in. Check out. Wait for your Amazon Prime delivery. That's it. It's that simple. That's what I need you to do. All right? Too easy. I also want to thank uh, Top Notch Tactics, why I got your attention. Those guys' uh, info should be up on the website coming soon. Um, they're just a really good security company, veteran-owned, police-owned, um, great group of guys. Um, they're really making some headway out there, so be on the lookout for them for all your security needs. TopNotchTactics.com is where you can find them for right now. Um, like I said, their, uh, their link will be up on our website soon. So, um, make sure you're going to Amazon click through. That's really all I need y'all to do. So, uh, go ahead and relax. Big bow out. As we like to say, supporting great causes is not only a great way to help others and your community. It's also a great way to help yourself. Now he, we here at the street warrior radio podcast, encourage people to seek out great organizations that donate the majority of their profits or proceeds to the causes that they're actually trying to help with that I want you to take a look at a couple of organizations humanizing the badge now humanizing the badge is a nonprofit organization on a mission to help forge stronger relationships between law enforcement officers and the communities that they serve they're engaging that mission through community service projects on a national level providing free confidential online support for first responders and their families that reach out to deal with the unique stresses of the job and engage on social media content through their pages and the pages of content creators that are part of their cause. And for example, Mike the Cop, Officer Daniels, Deputies Hook'em and Book'em, Deputy Misdemeanor, etc. Great organization. Please go over to humanizingthebadge.com, check them out, and if you're so inclined, please donate. Also, Guardian for Heroes. Guardian for Heroes is an organization that humbly and proudly carries the torch that Chris Kyle, the American sniper, left and championed the cause to restore hope, renew spirits, and replenish energy for combat veterans transitioning to post-military life. At no cost to the beneficiary of the organization, Guardian for Heroes provides health club memberships, individualized programs, personal training, in-home fitness equipment, and life coaching to in-need veterans with disabilities, Gold Star families, and those suffering from post-traumatic stress from combat deployment. They use a variety of different physical and mental fitness techniques to spark conversation and create a support, a source of support for combat veterans. This is an extremely important cause. Go over to guardianforheroes.org, check them out, and if you're so inclined, please donate. You can also go to the streetwarriorradio.com website, and on the left-hand side of every page, there's links to different organizations that we champion. Click on those. Do your research. If you're comfortable, please give them a support. Also, if you have an organization that you support that we don't know about, you can contact us at streetwarriorradio.com slash contact or on that email at streetwarriorradio, I'm sorry, info at streetwarriorradio.com. Give us the information, a link to the organization and why you think we should know about them and support them. And we will definitely look into it and see what we can make happen. As always, Street Warrior Radio.
This is Street Warrior Radio episode 011 with your host, Big Bo, and me, JC. On this episode, we feature Dr. Mike Simpson. Mike is an incredible guy who served as a U.S. Army Ranger and Green Beret, Joint Special Operations Command Physician, MMA Fight Doctor, and is currently an emergency medical physician and trains civilians in law enforcement as part of Sheepdog Response. You may also know Mike from his time on the History Channel series Hunting Hitler and as host of the Sheepdog Project podcast. Mike is a real American patriot who's dedicated most of his life to serving others. We covered a variety of topics from his upbringing to his army career to hunting Hitler and a host of other fascinating things. So sit back, strap in, and enjoy this episode as we welcome Dr. Mike Simpson to the Street Warrior Radio Podcast. Mike, thanks for being here. Thanks for having me. I really appreciate it. Yeah, um, we are super excited to have you on the podcast. Yes, sir. Um, we got like a million things to talk to you about. Um, so I just want to jump right into it if you're good with that. Yeah, let's do it. All right, cool. Um, all right, so for those uh, people out there in the world that don't know anything about you, um, could you kind of give a, a quick rundown or a brief rundown, or you can be as long-winded as you want, um, <laughs> on uh, where you come from and... Uh, kind of what your childhood was like? Sure. So uh, I come from, uh, I identify, Tatchby, California is my hometown. So that's, that's where I went, spent my formative years and I went to high school. I was actually born in the Los Angeles area. Uh, My parents, uh, I was prepubescent when my parents moved out of that area. So really uh, everything that made me what I am today, uh, I, I, credit my upbringing uh in in Tatchby, which is a little small town in southern california up in the mountains um walking down the street with a 22 rifle over my shoulder nobody nice. thought anything of it you know ever everybody uh everybody had a pocket knife on their belt or in their pocket at school and guns in the gun rack out in the parking lot and yep. you know guys would uh show up to first period talking about the coyote they killed while they were out feeding the chickens that morning. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's why they were a little late cause they were skinning it. And, uh, <laughs> to, to me, this was all, all normal, <laughs> uh, went in the army two weeks out of high school, uh, in 1984, uh, during the Reagan administration, uh, I was an infantryman, uh, was assigned to the first ranger battalion, went there after airborne school. I spent four years in the first ranger battalion, uh, got out, but went in the Special Forces National Guard. I thought I might want to uh, do college and pursue a career in law enforcement, but really after a couple years, I decided that wasn't going to happen, and I went back in, uh, w- uh, became uh, an 18 Charlie Special Forces Demolition Sergeant, went to the 7th Special Forces Group. Uh, I was there from 91 until 2002, first as a, a demo guy and then later as a medic, and then uh, went to medical school in 2002. Uh, emergency medicine residency after that. <clears throat> I was blessed enough that uh, my reputation in the soft community was still good enough that I was welcomed back. And uh, I got a pretty choice assignment out of residency, uh, assigned to JSOC uh, as an emergency medicine physician, got to do five deployments with them, and then uh, deployed uh, multiple times, and then uh, ultimately retired uh, in 2016, the end of 2016. And after that, I uh, went to work uh, with my good friend Tim Kennedy for a company called Sheepdog Response. And uh, we do a lot of work uh, sharing the knowledge that we've gathered over decades uh, with others. So, and I really enjoy doing that. I'm, I'm hearing a lot of laziness in your life. Right. Just, I just I'm, I'm, a, I, I'm a pretty chronic underachiever. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what a homebody. <laughs> well, that's, yeah. uh, so that's hey, pretty this awesome, is what man. When you, have a, when you have a ginger from a broken home with a short man's complex, he's constantly oh, trying to prove himself. So. Right, right. <laughs> um, so you said, you said broken home, but like, what, what, was your, what was your family dynamic like? Yeah. When I say broken home, I'm really exaggerating. My my <laughs> my stepfather came into they, my it life. It was all perfect, you know. And, yeah. <laughs> well, my stepfather came into my life at age two, so I've I've only known one father. I had a very very functional family. Gotcha. Uh, you know the 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 although the the man that raised me was not my biological father. Right. Um, I he is my dad, and I love him dearly. You know, God God rest him. He passed away a few years ago, but uh, it, we we had a, a a great family life, and uh, there were times that that we struggled to some extent, but there was, there was, I never went hungry. There was always food on the table. Awesome. Uh, and, uh, I, I have to say I had a, uh, 
uh, you know, I, I still have a great relationship with with most of the people in my family. It's not. Uh, I make jokes about you know the, the Simpson family reunion and what it's like, but uh, we're actually pretty pretty functional and we yeah. and we all get along really well. So that's good. Yeah, that's good. Um, when uh, so when you were growing up, did you, do you have brothers, sisters, anything like that, or uh, I have always... a I have a I have a younger I have a, a half sister who my sister. Yeah, she's six years younger than gotcha. I am. So uh, such a big age difference that uh it's uh that that's a that's a huge gap and i was worried about that actually because my my sons have the same age gap but oh, i wow. think i think because they're both boys i think that that has made a difference they're actually very close uh and my my sister and i were uh i think when you have uh siblings of different genders unless they're in the same grade or close to it you know or going to high school together i don't think uh you know, there, there's not a lot of commonality. Like, you right. know, we're we're essentially almost a generation apart. Yeah. You know, and what you know, musically and 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 everything else. I mean, you know, she's my sister, and I love her dearly. But, um, you know, we don't we don't have like the same same hobbies and uh, the the same things that we like to do, and we have a, a profoundly different outlook on life. I'm sure. <laughs> that tends to, that tends to happen. But yeah. Um. So, what uh, what kind of student were you? Uh, not very good, actually. So, um, uh, I was in in the elementary school years. Um, I actually uh, and uh, up really through middle school, I I excelled. You know, I got uh, you know honor roll type grades, and it was about the time that I discovered three three things came into my life at the same time. Uh, they were in, in no particular order. Girls, football, and alcohol. Yep. <laughs> and uh, I, I figured out that I can, I can show up to class, mm-hmm. get a, get a high B on the test without ever having done homework, and I'll still pass the class. Yep. That that was that was the system that got me through. Yep. Yeah. So, and I, me too. I also figured out that essay questions were my friend because I have as as uh, one of my social studies teachers told me to my face. Uh, I had had a gift for bullshit. All right. So, uh, so essay questions were my friend. So then college was um, fairly easy for you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I, I ended up graduating, uh, 102 out of 122 in my, uh, my graduating class. Dang. Uh, yeah. So not, not, not all the way at the bottom, but, but, but I was down there a little bit and I didn't, I didn't actually know that until, uh, I decided uh, ultimately to go to college and I had to get my, my transcripts and I saw that. So I was really surprised to see that. I kind of, kind of thought, I was kind of thought I was middle of the road. Um, but, uh, it didn't affect me in, in my college career cause I applied myself and, yeah. you know, I, I, I saw this, it, the, the big question that I had all through high school is, you know, you know, questions, a lot of high school, when am I going to use this? Why is this really important? Other mm-hmm. than the fact that, that there's some adults, who are telling me it's important. I, I already knew that I wanted to go in the army and I wanted to be an airborne ranger. And I didn't understand how knowing, uh, how many times the globe theater burned down, uh, was going to help me be an airborne <laughs> ranger. Right. I, you know, I didn't understand, uh, you know, how I was going to use, you know, algebra and things like that. Although, you know, w- when I became a demolition sergeant, I, I certainly saw the value in mathematics, but, um, yeah, I, I would have to say in, in high school I was I was a very lazy student in high in high school. You know, I applied myself in in undergraduate and, and obviously in med school, but uh, not uh, not in my secondary education. I yeah. was very much the same way. I was like, I don't need this. I'm just gonna go join the army. Right. And I'll be yeah, in the army. Like, you don't need like a, you, you don't need to be smart in the army. Yeah, you you know that all your recruiters already told you that all you need is uh is your diploma yeah and that that's it exactly <laughs> so, you, and you know that you know the bar has been set and it's like well i just hey there's all there's a lot to do you know there's parties to go to exactly i gotta work on my el camino i you know there, i got stuff to do i have a yeah. social life time for the school mm-hmm. business yeah. mm-hmm. so uh what inspired you to join the army um you know i'm not i'm not really sure what particularly kind of kind of grabbed me I, i'd have to say that uh there was a one of my best friends growing up was a, a guy named brian edwards he was a year older than me brian ultimately became the uh special forces command sergeant major and he just retired last year okay. um and 
he and I talked about it quite a bit, you know, and we, and, you know, we'd watch movies, uh, with another small group of my friends, a guy named, named Shannon Babb, who also uh, was my year, went in the army. Um, and there was also a deputy sheriff in our area who, uh, had been a Green Beret in Vietnam. Oh, wow. And, uh, you know, just listening to the stories that he was, would tell and, you know, he'd, you know, this, the, you know, the pictures that he had, you know, what things were like and you know, the things that he would talk about. I started to get this this sense of what it might be like to be a part of something larger than myself and to really you know put myself uh, to the hazard as it were you know you know right, really yeah. uh, you know push the envelope and you know see what I'm capable of and I wasn't you know I, w- I, I played football all four years of high school but I was not a star athlete I was not a first string varsity player and I was you know, I'm a smaller than average guy, slower than average guy. And there were a lot of people uh, that I went to high school with that did not think I was going to be able to make it as an airborne ranger and didn't, you know, the, the idea of, you know, then ultimately going on to special forces that, you know, they didn't, they pretty much discounted that yeah. in, in, entirely. Um, and, uh, you know, really by just getting through and biting a hole through my lower lip and just deciding that, well, I, you're going to have to kick me out because I'm not going to quit is, is ultimately how I made it through. Yeah. And, you know, that's – I've never done any of those schools, but that's just the same sentiment I hear from so many people in those schools. It's not the most athletic. It's not the smartest. It's who has the biggest heart and essentially just do you really want this? Yeah, exactly. And I knew that it, it was something that I really wanted and – uh, again, that was it was really liberating for me that when I realized, well, I just all I have to do is just not quit. Oh, yeah. And if they kick me out, you know, there's no I, I can hold my head high and say, you know, I gave 100 percent and and they kicked me out. You know, they said I, I didn't meet the standard and they sent me home. But as long as I keep trying and don't you know, as long as the, those two words I quit don't come out of my mouth, I will be able to look myself in the mirror uh, for the rest of my life and know that I gave it my all. Yeah. You can't, you can't put a price on living no, yourself. No, that's true. Yeah. So, uh, what was Ranger school like for you? Uh, I think it, for me, I think it was the same. It was for anybody. <laughs> it's miserable. Um, uh, I started out in a winter class and I got pneumonia, uh, late in Darby phase and the pneumonia kicked in fully right when we got to mountain phase. And I thought I was going to be able to, to keep going anyway and the moment that I realized I wasn't going to be able to was when I lost my appetite oh, man. Uh, and actually my ranger buddy said he said you can't if you're not eating you're really sick and he goes we're already debilitated you're just not going to be able to go on oh man and uh, so I went on sick call and as uh, soon as they as soon as the, the PA that was there checked me out uh, he was like mm. You know, I mean, he was handing guys sepal call lozenges and Motrin and sending them right back out. Yep. And he looked at me and he took my temperature and made a face and he listened to my lungs and made a face. He said, go, there's a bed in there, go lay down. And uh, I went in and there was two other guys and they had like a mini hospital ward. They ended up uh, loading us in a field ambulance, driving us down the mountain uh, to a local hospital doing chest x-rays on all of us. And he said, uh yeah, you're not going back to training. You know, we're gonna we're gonna ship you to Fort Benning, and you're gonna get admitted to the hospital there. Mm. Uh, yeah, I, I uh, so I got recycled, and uh, it was good. It gave me time, you know, to to heal up. My my body was pretty beat down from from Darby phase, Man. and uh, I didn't have any issues afterwards. You know, I had the one, I had a medical recycle, but uh, passed all my patrols and and never had an issue with any of my gates. And obviously, I was it was miserable. Uh, even after getting out of the hospital and having enough time to gain my weight back that I'd already lost and actually gain a little bit more, I still came out ranger school at the end, 14 pounds lighter than when I, than I went in, wow. uh, pretty beat up, you know, I had, you know, sores on my body and God. bruises, bruises from the thigh down from the cypress stumps in, in Florida phase and that are just below the water. You can't see, yeah. but, uh, I, I remember, you know, standing there on the parade, I was the guide on bear and the, the, the guide on was actually mounted on a 35 pound log. And I remember standing there holding it on graduation day, uh, just a shell of my former self, but, uh, just 
feeling so good about that. Oh, I'm sure. Um, although all I wanted to do is sleep and eat. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> I bet. And, so, uh, so what was uh, what was the issue? What was the what what they find in the X-ray? What what made you be admitted to the hospital? Uh, that, I, that I had pneumonia. Oh, pneumonia. Yeah, okay, gotcha. yeah, yeah. I had I had pneumonia, and uh, they they admitted me. They kept me kept me over in the in the clinic in Dahlonega. Um, I want to say for two nights, and then uh, a helicopter flew up and picked. Uh, in the end, it ended up being I think four or five of us that got uh, that got medically recycled out of that class Damn. because of pneumonia. It, it kind of spread through a, a good pocket of yeah, us. It'll catch up. And they you. flew us down to the Army hospital there at Benning. Uh, they checked us in there. Some of us were actually allowed to go uh, that night or the next day. Uh, um, I was pretty lucky. They just kind of kept me over in the ER for observation, checked me out. And uh, I'd, at that point, I'd already been on antibiotics for two days. And they said, uh, yeah, you're, you're probably good. You can you know, manage the rest of this in the, in the holdover barracks and sent me to the holdover barracks. But, uh, yeah, not uh, – not the way I would advise doing no, it. No, I'd imagine um, not. <laughs> but at least you got to gain a little bit of weight. So, I mean, imagine if you wouldn't have got to put a little bit of yeah, extra weight that, on. Yeah, I probably would have come out at least 20 pounds under yeah. um, if it wasn't wasn't for that that fact that I got to, you know, initially I didn't want to eat. But, but once I was out of the hospital, my appetite kicked back in and I was on holdover status. Um, I was just eating everything in sight. I so. oh, yeah, I bet. Sure. So uh, how is Ranger School unique from other special ops schools? Um, Ranger School is unique in, uh, a couple of different ways. It's, uh, I mean, you, you really, you embrace the suck for the, for the whole time. And, <laughs> and the duration of Ranger School has, has, has changed over time. When I, in the eighties, it was 58 days. Wow. And that's, uh, uh, I, it's, it went up at one point because they put some longer breaks in there. I don't even know what it is now, but, uh, at the time it was, it was 58 days and the, and the most you got off between phases was, uh, you'd get like a six or eight hour pass, uh, to basically go do laundry and, and eat a pizza. Wow. Um, That's a, there you go. Geez. Yeah. Pizza and laundry is your break. Yeah, that, that's it. That, that was your break. <laughs> and it's, uh. The thing about Ranger School, the other thing that, that may, not only that you're embracing the suck for so long, uh, because it's it's complete, you know, it's it's caloric deprivation and, and sleep deprivation yeah. the whole time. You know, it's you're you're getting, uh, if you're in a in a winter class, you're getting two MREs a day, and uh, this what's funny is they get two MREs now in a winter class. And the number of calories in an MRE now is twice what it was in the 1980s, and we were getting two MREs at the time back then. So, oh wow! Not to say we had, not to say we had it harder, but yeah, we had it. Harder. <laughs> uh, <laughs> in a summer class, uh, you you ended up getting one and a half MREs per day. Um, how they, how does you decide know, what half you get? <laughs> well, you get the breakfast well, the, bar and then the, the no, weed the, snack. So bread. you would really, you would only get one chance every twenty four hours to eat. Oh wow! That that's that's the way that it worked out. Is you would get one chance. You you would have a priorities of work phase uh, every night that you would get a chance to eat. So typically, what you would do is you would eat a full MRE during that time, and then you would have uh, out of the MREs that you had you would pick things out and have them in your pockets to, you know, eat some peanut butter or cheese spread during the right. day when, when the RI wasn't looking and was, was out, was out of range that he couldn't smell it. <laughs> and you would try to do it that God. way. And smell but, it. Uh, <laughs> That's yeah. the worst. So, <laughs> that sounds horrible. Oh, yeah. So, well, the, so the, so the, the RIs couldn't really <clears> do it, but as a ranger student, if somebody opened a pack of cheese spread, you could smell it from a hundred feet yeah. away. God. I mean, you just, you just could. Cause you're so hungry. Um, yeah, you're so hungry all the time, and you're 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 completely become primal, and you haven't bathed. And <laughs> Everybody's growling each other. Yeah, it's it's ridiculous. But but fights between Ranger School students are the most pathetic thing you've ever seen because you have no energy. Right. So they're like, eh. it's like it's yeah, a it's bunch like they of just fall to the ground. It's like Everybody's right, just waving I'm their so arms. I'm so sorry. Yeah. I'm so sorry. This it's was a, stupid. <laughs> yeah, this is this is a dumb thing to fight over, uh, but. It, it, my class ended up being uh, worse because in Florida phase, all the MREs that were in the warehouse got recalled. Oh. 
So they had a whole, they had batches of MREs. Uh, there were a couple reasons they got recalled. One was there was metal shavings in the applesauce. Oh, that makes I don't sense. remember what, what the other reason was. But so Florida all of a sudden had no MREs. God. And we were in the field and we were supposed to get resupplied. Uh, we were in the field on a, at, at the very end of Florida phase, you did a, you did a, a, a 14 day field problem. And we had only been in the field, like, you know, we, we went out with, I think, three days worth of stuff. We're supposed to get resupplied on day four. Well, that was when the recall occurred. And it took them two days to figure out what they were going to do. They're that like, sucks. they had, like had committee meetings for two days while we walked around hungry. And then, <laughs> yeah. yeah. And wow. then they said, oh, oh well, well, what we'll do is every morning when uh, at, at RI changeover, RI changeover would always occur at like seven, six or seven o'clock in the morning. So you would be near a road intersection somewhere where the vehicles would pull up, the fresh RIs would get off the truck and uh, they would be your RI for the next 24 hours and the old RIs would get on the truck and leave. So what they were doing is at RI changeover, they were bringing out these box lunches. God. But the downside to this hot was- They were just giving you box lunches. Yeah, well, and you couldn't, you couldn't carry – it wasn't like the cheese spread and the crackers yeah. and the dried fruit mix you could carry in your pockets and eat it whenever you wanted to eat it. They made you eat all this right in front of them. Oh, that sucks. And the, on the first day, it was like it was like an apple, two sandwiches, uh, a milk, a juice box, and a cookie. And it was like – we were like, <laughs> all right, I can do this. <laughs> well, by two days later, it was a shriveled up mandarin orange – and one sandwich that uh, a homeless person probably would have turned their nose up at. Uh, like it became, it became one thinly sliced piece of turkey and one thinly sliced piece of government cheese. God. No mustard, no mayo. Yum. There were no cookies anymore. And oh, they took the you're cookies? Drink, yeah, no wow. cookies and no, uh, uh, no juice box, no milk. It was you were expected to drink out of your canteen. Is so you know, gonna- basically – it became a sandwich a if day. If they're going to give you a shit sandwich, they can at least give you a cookie at the end of that. Yeah. No, there was none of that. So wow. it became, yeah, it, it, it became uh, pretty pitiful by, by the end of it. So we were, we we're pretty happy to get out of there I bet. by the end. But, uh, uh, it, the thing about Ranger school though, is it's not, you know, it's all about patrolling and you know, they, it's, it, it's primarily a leadership school. So right. it's not, you, you don't, the, the idea is to know everything you need to know about how to write op orders and how to, you know, plan a patrol and, and how to read a map and all that stuff before you get there because that's not what you're going to learn. You're going to learn how to motivate people under stress when people are absolutely at their worst and they haven't slept in three days and they haven't eaten in two days and it's raining and you're in a swamp and they don't want to do anything and you got to say, hey, man, how about you pick up that machine gun and walk <laughs> – five kilometers and let's uh I, right now i just i just really want to go kill some terrorists come on it's fun you know? come on and, yeah come on it'll be fun you know you'll come and i'll, I'll be there and it'll be great that is the best and, sales pitch i've ever heard for ranger school if someone would have told me this in the army i'd have been like dude we're going to sign up for ranger school yeah and then you've been cursing that person later <laughs> i though, may i not. may have but that was a great recruiting yeah. tool right there i mean i'm gonna play that to recruiters <laughs> like you want to sell ranger school here you go this is the real deal yeah yeah, uh. it's like it's it's basically it's teaching you how to be like a mini Tony Robbins in the swamp in the right. middle of the night. You know, you just got to you got to you got to pick people up and you got to get them moving. And uh, and it's and people have different leadership styles. You know, there's some people are Tony I'm going to yell at you or I'm going to threaten you, and some people are like, hey man, we can do this. You know, I'm I believe I believe can in you because you, you're the best you you can be. Feel the power. You know, yeah, exactly. And you see like all different aspects of it, but at the at, in the end all whenever somebody gets in that leadership position, all you think about is what type of a follower they were 3 hours right. ago. God. Like, oh, that's 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 the asshole that didn't want to carry the machine gun yesterday. That's the guy that fell asleep fell asleep on guard duty. Oh man. And I got in trouble for it or you know or or the guy that got us lost or you know want you know we spent an extra three hours with our feet wet because he, you know, he couldn't figure out where we were on the map or, you know, whatever mm-hmm. it was. And, uh, it's hard to not, you know, to really not, to not turn on people at that I point. Bet. I mean, it's, uh, you know, you're, you're broken down. So, um, what, uh, 
what was the uh, what was the evolution for you to uh, make the switch to special forces? Uh, it was something that I had always considered, and uh, actually, when I when I went to MEPS uh, in high school, and I was on the delayed entry program, I wanted to do SF right out of high school, and I was actually I missed the window of being able to do that by just a few months. Um, they they decided that they wanted to get away from taking people right out of high school. Uh, that's something that came back later under what they call the 18 X-ray program. But so the the guys who graduated a year ahead of me, my buddy Brian being one of them, they were able to do a direct SF pipeline type thing. You know, they went uh, basic training, airborne school, reported to Fort Bragg, reported to the Q course. Okay. Um, and I couldn't I couldn't do that. And it was something that I always wanted to do. And uh, weird coincidence, you know, my the, my Brian, my buddy from high school, we were actually in the same ranger school class. And, uh, you know, so we, we had some time, uh, in some little breaks here and there to kind of catch up and him tell me, you know, what life was like in SF. And, you know, I told him what life was like in the ranger battalion. And, uh, it was something that, that I always considered, you know, going to, going to do later in life. And then when, I decided to get out. I knew I didn't want to sever ties with the military completely because I, I really enjoyed it. And I looked the, – the couple options that were out there were – there were some uh, some long-range reconnaissance National Guard units and there were some SF National Guard units. And uh, ultimately, uh, in talking to both, the Special Forces National Guard unit, which was headquartered out of Florida, was – the, I, I liked what they had to tell me a little bit better about what my opportunities were going to be and everything else. So uh, uh, went uh, and signed up with them. And then uh, ultimately that was, that was 20 Special Forces Group who mobilized uh, during Desert Storm, Desert Shield, although mobilized but did not deploy. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, and that was ultimately the time frame that I went to selection and decide to, decided to stay on active duty and, and go SF full time. Gotcha. So Cool. Um. <clears throat> How do you feel that uh, your experiences as a as a ranger and even a Green Beret shaped your shaped your outlook on life, uh, both professionally and uh, personally? Uh wow. Um, I I'd say it's a, it was a huge impact. I think the the impression that Ranger Battalion made on me or in my early twenties. Uh, still to this day, I I have to be fifteen minutes early everywhere <laughs> I go. Uh, yep. I backwards plan literally everything in every part of my day and everything I do, you know, uh, you know, today being a great example, I knew I had to be on with you guys at a certain time. I backwards planned everything from my, my workout to, you know, the, the errands that I had to run and, you know, feeding the dogs, right. everything, uh, prior to that. Um, it also taught me so much about what, how much more I'm actually capable of than I might otherwise think I'm capable of and how much punishment I can take, how tired mm -hmm, I can mm -hmm. get, how much pain I can yeah. endure. Um, and, and that's helped me. And you, you learn so, you learn so much by the people that are around you, by your leaders. Uh, you know, and I, one of early on, somebody told me you can learn just as much from a bad leader as you can from a good oh, leader. And I found that 100%. Yes. Yeah. I mean, you learn, you know, that's, these are things I, these are things I never want to right. do. Right. Yeah, you know, exactly. I don't, it, this, this is what he does. I, a hundred, I, I am never going to be, I don't ever want to hear those words coming out of my mouth. Um, I, they, I think they shaped me tremendously. They gave me opportunities, uh, to work with such amazing people, to learn skills, uh, you know, you learn a second language, uh, um, you know, I, I was a, became a fluent Spanish speaker when I was in seventh group and got to travel all over Central and South America, get exposed to things culturally I never would have seen. Um, and ultimately, the, you know, the introduction to, to medicine as an SF medic uh, that really opened up for me what was going to be the, the rest of my life, which was, you know, practicing medicine and, and taking care of sick right. people. Um, and I, I credit with uh, the, the discipline – that was instilled in me in the Ranger Battalion early on, and uh, that was refined, uh, and the, the the sense of individuality uh, and being a self starter that you know that uh, was definitely came to the forefront during my my time in Special Forces, and the amazing uh, NCOs that were there that just provided such 
great examples on on what a person can do when they when they set their mind to it, uh, and and some amazing officers as well. You know, I I, I credit most most of the outstanding individuals I have seen in my career as having been NCOs, right. but uh, you know, guys, you know, General Anthony Fletcher, uh, I worked for him as a as a young captain, and uh, I. If he walked through the door today and somebody lobbed in a grenade behind him, I'd jump on that grenade sure. for him. Um, so, you know, I've been very privileged to work with some pretty amazing and people. And so you, you also had the unique opportunity, though, to to be on both sides of the house, though, right? You, as, as, an, as an enlisted person yeah. and then as an officer, correct? I, I did. And I never, you know, I never... Uh, I never took the walk as an officer. You know, I was a, I was a physician, right. so that kind of insulated me yeah. a little bit. Um, but... Uh, I've definitely seen the soft community uh, from from both sides of that prism, um, and I have to say that uh, no matter who I was working with, whether it was uh, whether it was Rangers, whether it was uh, you know Tier One operators uh, from the Army side or or from the Navy side, you know with the SEALs, <clears throat> everybody universally, as soon as they found out that I was an enlisted guy previously, I I immediately got treated. Oh yeah. yeah, for sure. You get a little that extra clout. Oh, he he understands yeah. and he gets it. But yeah. that can also yeah, that like, can also hinder you too a little bit because if you're uh an officer who's like a jerk, people will be like, "Oh, you forgot where you came from." Yeah, and you, and you do see that. Oh, you yeah. know, you see people who forget where they where they came oh, yeah. from. And uh it's uh it's painful to watch officers like yeah. that. You know, the the officers that were were prior enlisted who who don't remember that and uh it's it really it makes you really makes you grind your teeth when you see yeah, it that. really does so what was the path for you to practice in medicine um the path for me was you know uh, obviously uh, just going through the sf meta course i knew that medicine was going to be my future <clears throat> and i i basically knew from that time on uh that as I kind of counted down the days till ultimately I would get promoted to master sergeant, that was going to be the time that I was going to have to make that decision point. And uh, primarily, I wanted to go to PA school, but at the time they were uh, they didn't they'd gotten to a point that they didn't want SF medics going to PA school, and they were trying to discourage that. Why is that? that? Uh, um, some people in the PA corps. Uh, we're trying to consolidate it in a different direction, gotcha. and uh, the excuse that they used was uh, because I, this was a phone conversation that I had with the branch manager at the time. Well, they said, well, the problem is all USF guys are too old, so basically you become a PA, um, you work as a PA for a little while, and then you, you make your 20 years as a captain or a major – you retire, mm-hmm. and uh, so we're not – the PA Corps is not getting top-heavy enough. You know, We need longevity. Gotcha. We okay, need people yeah. that are going to make 05 and 06, sure. right? Um, and the fact was, was they had the people that were making 05 and 06, but, but here, were, here was the deal. The SF medics uh, have always been the cream of the, of the PA crop in the Army. Uh, because they come in with the most experience, they bring the most to the table, and I don't think any any PA would have a problem with me saying that. Those were the guys that, it, when they reached the twenty year mark, um, they were getting these great job offers on the sure, outside. Yeah. Oh, yeah. So 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 they were jumping on them, you know. And uh, some of the people who came in who might have been lab technicians or whatever it was before, who didn't have that clinical background, who maybe struggled a little bit more through the PA course and maybe weren't as clinically sound, they weren't getting those high tier job offers. So they were staying in a little bit longer and probably making 05 and 06 in the PA Corps. But what the PA Corps was concerned with was this bottleneck that you have where they we start where the PA Corps starts competing with Medical Service Corps and the Nursing Corps and and you know and physicians for these hospital commander jobs and everything else. And you know if if what they were left with was uh, the the PAs who were the second tier PAs because the top tier PAs had already gotten out, they weren't going to be as competitive, and that wasn't going to get them where they wanted to go in the long run. Um, 
this was I had a lot of conversations with with people who who did careers in the PA Corps about about that time and about kind of their opinions on on where it was going. But suffice it to say, they didn't want really uh, SF medics or anybody who'd been in the army army longer than about twelve years. They didn't they didn't gotcha. want you. Wow. Yeah, because they didn't think you had enough longevity. Um, but I did find out that there was no cap. Uh, I could apply to medical school and either through an HPSP scholarship or to go to USIS, which ultimately is what I did, um, with regardless of how much service I had. So ultimately, that's what I did. I went to the Uniform Services uh, uh, University of the Health Sciences, graduated there, and I knew from day one in medical school uh, I was – 75% sure that I wanted to do emergency medicine, maybe 25% you know, entertaining the idea of possibly doing family medicine because the two uh, are the most operational specialties. Um, by the time uh, – you know, 9-11 had already happened when I started medical school. By a year, year and a half into the, into the war, so I hadn't even gotten out of my first year of medical school yet, the stories coming out – and the reports coming from the battlefield and out of the soft community of we are going full on emergency medicine physician. This is what we, this is what we need. Uh, that, that made up my sure, mind for yeah. me. It's if, if I'm, if I'm going back to the soft community in any capacity, I, I'm doing it as an ER well, physician. I, I think and, to, to, to further that point that, uh, you know, the experiences that the, you know, special operations troops have, you know, experienced as far as combat casualties, in both Iraq and Afghanistan have shaped combat medicine like or traumatic or tra or trauma yeah. care like across the board i mean not not even just in the military but even even us in law enforcement yeah you know now mm -hmm. we're we're paying attention to it we're going to school we're getting training on tourniquets and how to apply a uh, how to identify a sucking chest wound and uh, tension pneumothorax and being able to relieve that and you know all that mm -hmm. kind of stuff and it's 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 incredible you know the the knowledge that's come out of in that topic that's come out of the war and mm -hmm. yeah and, and obviously that's that's kind of you know the origins are what you're kind of talking about there so it's pretty interesting yeah and especially in those first couple of years of the war because you know that if you look at this you know at the at the general officer level as the reports were coming out of the battlefield, you have uh, the soft guys getting in the most engagements right. of anybody, uh, uh, you know, the most rounds downrange, um, taking pretty high casualties, and yet having the highest survival right, yeah. rate. That's true. And so that that was the big question that they had. They're like, why do these guys have the highest survival rate? Oh, well, it has to do with tourniquets, yep. and it has to do with their training. Every single ranger and every single guy on a team is getting trained by his medics uh, in in how to do these yeah. things, and that's you know ultimately that all became T Triple C, mm -hmm. which you know of course became adopted uh, D O uh, D officially D O D Y a long time ago. Although the push has just rejuvenated itself for everybody in D O D, you there is no excuse. You will do T Triple C every right, two years, good. and. And, and it is good. And now, of course, like as you said, we're seeing that uh, make its way where it's badly needed in, in law enforcement. And that's one of the things that I absolutely love doing is you know teaching my SOTEC courses and, and sharing that knowledge and getting it to law enforcement first responders and even you know civilians who just want to sure, be Sure, absolutely. For sure. So what was the biggest challenge going from soldier to medical school? Uh... <laughs> biochemistry <laughs> all the smart stuff <laughs> <laughs> yeah so I, I i did really good in undergrad i did i did night school and i actually did um you know uh, kind of funny that the, that the guy who graduated i'm gonna uh, I'll, I'll go ahead and brag on myself a little bit so the guy who graduated 102 out of 122 then when i ultimately decided to finish my undergraduate degree i did uh three years of college in a year and a half uh, while going to night school, while being in SF, and and I graduated summa, so uh, I felt pretty good about my study habits and everything when I got to yeah. med school, but um, they the med school really is the fire hose, and 
especially when it came to things like uh, like biochemistry. Um, that w- that was one. Biochemistry and microbiology were two that. Um, yeah, it's just here. We're gonna we're gonna latch this fire hose to your face, and you try to drink it as fast as you can and not drown, and uh, and we'll see how you do on the other end. Um, so the, those were probably the biggest challenges, and that and, and kind of I really had to modify my my study pattern. And w- what I eventually figured out was in uh, in medical school uh, they don't take attendance. You're not required to go. They don't. Or should I say they don't take attendance at lectures? Okay. You're a tri- you're required to go to anything that is a lab class. Yeah. That you know you're you know you're putting putting drops of stuff on slides or looking through microscopes or or dissecting tissue or whatever uh-huh. it might be. But you're not required to go to lectures. And the mistake that I made the first semester of medical school was I went to all the lectures because I thought I would walk out of those with the, all the information that I needed. And what I figured out was I could read the information in the textbook twice in the same amount of time that it took to sit through the lecture and then read it again one other time that night. So I'd get it three times as opposed to once. And uh, really once I stopped going to lectures is uh, it, and kind of changed my, my learning pattern and realized that I'm going to have to read this on my own – because you, you you know you guys know how it is for uh, I'm sure the police academy is the oh, same yeah. way and military military schools are the same way. So you go to the mm-hmm. lecture, and that lecturer is required. If, you know he he knows what the test questions right. are, right? He's required to address those mm-hmm. test questions yep. during the course of that lecture, and some of them will even help you out with a little foot oh, stomp yeah. or a little <laughs> emphasis or a little underlining here right, or there. Yeah. Right, that, that's a regular army this. school. Yeah, you, you're. This is important. This might you might see this yeah. again. Right? How often right. do you hear that? Um, and although undergraduate wasn't that way, um, the thing that's different about you know undergraduate is my organic chemistry professor is the only one teaching me and the only one writing the test and the only one grading the test. It's not. For any given test, you might have five different lecturers, and they're all, you know, th- and, and they're all subspecialists. Uh, so you get a lot more individual time with the only person running the show. Sure. So you get a pretty good idea of what's important and what's not important. And uh, you're just in medical school; you just don't get that from the lectures. You know, you'll you'll get that from the basically the left and right limits that they set you up front. And then reading the course material, reading the textbook, is how gotcha. I got it. And you know, different people learn differently. Oh, yeah, but once uh, that that was a that was the game changer for me. Is is literally once I stopped going to lectures, and I actually stopped using an alarm clock too. Really. And uh, so I started getting more sleep. Yeah, I'd get up in the morning. Uh, my son was was two at the time. Uh, I'd get up when he woke me up. I'd make him breakfast. I'd have breakfast. Um, I'd get on the uh, get on the train. Um, I lived right off of the Shady Grove um, stop uh, in uh, Montgomery County. I'd ride the train down to school. I'd go into the library. I'd set up in a cubby somewhere and crack my textbook, and I had a a plan every day for what I was going to read. And basically I was going to read whatever was reflected in those lectures from that day that I wasn't going to. Um, And uh, and my plan was to read everything three times, which is what I did. So my my pathology book literally fell apart. At the end of uh, at the end wow. of second year, but uh, yeah, once I once I figured that out, that was uh, that was That's a game changer. Awesome. So were, were you go? Were you, okay, so were you going? You were going to school full time, right? In medical school, and then yeah. um, were you having to were you having to do? Was there any army responsibilities during that, or were you just going to school? No. Uh, so the way it works, so I went at the Uniformed Services University. You're you wear a uniform every day. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, okay, yeah. I, yeah. Okay. So the the way the way it was when I went to school, you wore class B's uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, and then you wore uh, uh, BDU's uh, Thursday, Friday, and uh, uh, casual days. Yeah, those were like you know casual right. Thursday and Friday, <laughs> um, and then when you were on clinicals, you'd wear, you know, whatever the hospital uniform of the day was because, you you know, of course, all your rotations were at DOD hospitals. You did in the summertime, 
after first year, they have a, a field exercise called uh, called Kirkeshner that they would do, which uh, we went out to Quantico. Uh, they do it at Fort Indian Town Gap now. It's a, and that's actually a much better exercise. Uh, we were, I think, we were the last class to do it, the old one at Quantico, because it was probably pretty problematic the way they did it then. My class actually wrote a pretty extensive after action review, and they changed a lot after that. But um, they do uh, that exercise, and then. In your fourth year, um, God, I'm, I'm having, I'm, I'm brain farting on. There's another long uh, field exercise you do in fourth year, and at that point, you're, you're pretty much a doctor. So instead of it, you know, basically, this is what a map looks like, and this is the business end of a rifle. So in case you carry one, you don't shoot yourself. That's first year. By the time you're doing a fourth year, you're actually setting up. You're setting up field hospitals and you're setting up evac gotcha. points and, and battalion That's aid stations awesome. and and you're getting a, a lot more of a feel for what your job is actually going to be like sure. operationally. Um, that's I, I, I just find all that fascinating. Um, Bushmaster. That's Bushmaster is the name of the exercise at the end. Yeah. Not to right. be associated with the the yeah with the snake. Um, yeah. Or the knife. Or the rifle. Or the rifle. <laughs> yeah. I was thinking. <laughs> <rifle. rifle>. Um, <laughs> uh, so. <laughs> Now, when it comes to emergency medicine, do you do you feel like, uh, given your special operations background, that emergency medicine, and I guess probably the excitement of that, um, was kind of a natural course for you, or is it just kind of a result of your personality? I think a little bit of both. I, I think, uh, you know, because, you know, you uh, – one thing that's unique about 18 Deltas is they are, in addition to being trauma medics, they are clinicians also. Right. Um, but uh, but there is a very heavy emphasis on trauma for obvious reasons. So uh, – and, and you have a lot uh, – by the time you graduate as an 18 Delta, um, you have had you have a lot of time in an emergency room, uh, a lot of time riding in the back of an ambulance. Gotcha. Um, uh, when I went through, you had to go back and get a paramedic certification. Um which they sponsored for you. Wow. Now they get it uh, actually during the course. So you're, you're already well exposed to, to pre-hospital trauma. So certainly that had a lot to do with sure. it. Um, I do think that personality wise, uh, two things about my, my personality that really lend themselves to emergency medicine that would probably prevent me from doing another specialty. Uh, I have an, a short attention span. <laughs> so the, you know, seeing seeing patients in these little like, okay, what's killing you today? All right, that's that's what we're gonna take care right. of. <laughs> that that works very what's well for me. You, you know, that's sitting down for a thirty minute appointment if there is such a thing anymore. I don't even know if I there don't is. Think so. And and having to go through a laundry list because when you're when you're seeing these, you know, a, a God bless internal medicine physicians because an internal medicine physician when somebody comes into their office. That's the equivalent of when your buddy says, hey, man, can you help me clean out my garage? <laughs> and he opens it up and like snowshoes and shit just fall out. Wow. It's like you're like, oh, my. Yeah. You know, I'm looking at I'm looking at decades of neglect and you want me to fix you in 30 minutes. Sure. That's what that's what an internal medicine. <laughs> here's, here's a pill. Go go forth. Yeah. Uh, we're going to have to break this down, uh, you know, um, and, and I just couldn't do that. Yeah. And I don't uh, also that. The, the horror stories that I hear from family medicine physicians and from internists about, uh, you know, non patients with non-compliance and patients, you know, that uh, they're having the same exact conversation every time they come into their office. And I'm a, I'm a very blunt person. Mm. I'm, I'm not, I'm not, I, 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 if it's a matter of, of saving your life with the honest truth and sparing your feelings, I'm going to save your life with the honest sure. truth. So I'm not the type of person people would probably want to come to as a as a primary care physician because you know they they would they would not they would walk out crying <laughs> when I told them if they don't stop eating French fries, I'm going to amputate their legs. Yikes! They wouldn't like that. Yeah, well, sure. Uh, but, I mean, but that's you know. the truth. <laughs> I mean, you know, but people don't want to hear the truth though. No, they don't, and uh, that's uh, and that's one of the well, hardest battles I, I think. Can't... We face in medicine today, I'm sure, and I, and I caveat that that statement with people that people often don't want to hear the truth about things that they're doing to themselves. So if they're doing it themselves, they don't mind all day long. You know, somebody else does something, and it's like, oh yeah, you know. But when it comes to them, 
that ego that ego yeah. and that defensive wall comes up and if we run into the mm-hmm. same thing in law enforcement i mean it's it's no <clears throat> excuse me it's no different you go to the same houses over and over and over again for the same problem and it's just like you're talking these people to death the same thing you're having the same conversation a mm-hmm. hundred times with these people it never changes yeah. you know well you you know what it I'll bet you guys can identify with this, and this is, and this is, I didn't, I kind of skipped over this and kind of telling you guys my abbreviated life story, sure. but um, during that time period that I was in the SF National Guard, um, I was a prison guard. Wow, that time. that's interesting. So, uh, yeah, I was, I was a corrections officer uh, in the state of Georgia, and a common, <laughs> yeah, a, a common thread that I saw, and I'll bet you guys see this too, is the people that you're talking to, the, you know, when I would talk to inmates, these guys were 100% convinced that their behavior was no different than mine, that I was doing the exact same things that, that they no, were yeah. doing. The only difference was they got caught. Right. Well, I always hear, you know, from people, oh, you think you're better than me. You live this. You must live a perfect lifestyle. You're just a perfect person. It's like, yeah, it, no, it's not that, but I just try to make better decisions with my time. Yeah, it's not. It's not about, yeah, it's I not. I try not to be a dumbass, it, I, you know? I, yeah, it just, you know, that's, hey, that's not mine. I'm not going to take exactly. it. Exactly. I'm not going to – it doesn't matter that somebody left their house open. It's not okay for me to go in and steal their television yeah, it's set. it's not okay. And, uh, you know, that's – you know, time and time again I heard that. You know, you're you're no different from me. You know, this – you know, luck is the only – is the reason that I'm on this side of these bars and, and you're on those side of these it's the like bars. It's like no choices. Choices, not luck, yeah, buddy. Choices. <laughs> yeah, choices. Well, it's like when I uh, – I, I keep seeing this uh, – this, uh, get repeated again and again and again on social media when uh, people are talking about the DACA dreamers mm-hmm. oh, yeah. and they're saying, and, and I keep seeing this posted. Um, the DACA dreamers have um, a cleaner criminal record and are having to pass a background check that 90% of Americans couldn't pass. And I'm like, what scumbags are you hanging right? out with? <laughs> That's true. Like I, I, I don't know anybody who couldn't, Past, you know, virtually everybody I know. Well, I, I mean, you know, granted, I'm a little bit slant. I mean, almost almost everybody I know had a top secret clearance. Exactly. So we've all, you've all, yeah, you've all been there. But uh, it, I, you know, who the the perception that everybody is committing all these crimes and that the only difference between the people who are doing time for them is you know is luck or demographics or socioeconomic status. That's a, a fallacy I've just never been able to wrap my head around. Yeah, I 100% agree. Yeah. It's all yeah. on it's all on the person and their drive and if they want to do better. You can yeah. blame where you grew up all day long, but if you're not, you know, trying to change that, well then you're just you're doing yourself a disservice. Well, and that's mm-hmm. the, you know, and that's the thing. You know, sometimes people grow up and they're told that it's outside forces that are going to keep them down and it's outside forces mm-hmm. that are going to prevent them from being successful but you know that's <clears throat> that's the beauty of our republic is that that's not true at the end of the day you make a choice and yes you may have depending on your upbringing and your background you may have different or maybe bigger challenges than other people to get where you want to be but at the end of the day you make a choice you know there are avenues for people to get out of poverty there are av- avenues for people to be successful if they want to be you know and Mm -hmm. but a lot of people get wrapped up in this and i want to call i guess i guess you can kind of call it like a victim mindset right yeah where it's like no you know but then they could be in that they become jaded right their outlook Mm -hmm. on the world becomes jaded and they look at everybody else and they're like oh yeah yeah no i'm in this situation because of you but you're just as you're just as bad as i am right yeah right so, okay, I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I saw this um, when I was doing some uh, some extra research on you. Um, and you, Oh, yeah. shit. <laughs> <laughs> I found the video, Mike. I found the video. No, um, so this, this just seems badass to me. But, um, and I don't know how much you can talk about it or not. Um, but what were counter-narcotics operations in South America like? Oh, uh, well, uh, it w- the, yeah, I mean, that's something I can totally okay, talk right. about. I didn't it know was, what there, that but, there was a line uh, yeah. there. Um, you know, I, I worked, uh, I worked very closely 
with uh, with the DEA. Uh, you know, there there were times that um, I've, I worked I've worked with the DEA, I, DEA. I've worked with other you know three letter organizations. Uh, you know, in very close proximity. Um, sometimes in uniform, sometimes not in uniform. Uh, worked with host nation governments. Um, uh, I've spent a lot of time in Colombia, uh, a lot of time. Um, I was uh, on the training team that trained the first counter narcotics battalion under Plan Colombia, no um, and uh, uh, I actually uh, myself uh, and Jeff Pouch uh, wrote the uh, the POI oh, wow. for their for their ten week medic course. Oh, that's awesome. Um, and uh, yeah, because really their their medics at the time were trained. Um, really is kind of a, like a hospital tech, hospital assistant type sure. role. Um, you know, the, uh, most of the most of the training that they would get, they would get a lot of didactic training, and then they would go to a military hospital and act as an assistant to many of the nurses. Um, they'd never been trained in a proper uh, trauma survey, um, how to do certain trauma interventions, and and. We we taught all that. and actually a lot of people told me it couldn't be done. They said you're, you know, you're never going to do it in ten weeks at the you know, the the educational level of the guys that you're going to get to train. And uh, I said I I disagree that's with a, you. That's I, a hold I, my beer moment. I, yeah, that is yeah, and it was a hold my beer moment. And w- uh, what to 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 a lot of people's credit uh, or to one 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 individual specifically said I was going to crash and burn. And uh, said it respectfully, but he said, "This is you're you're gonna you're gonna have a come to Jesus, and you're gonna realize real quick that you're gonna you know you teach him how to put bandages on and teach him, and, and that's gonna you know basically right. be it. You know, it's be very very basic first aid." And I said, "I don't think so." And uh, at the end of the course, that individual who's who was my battalion PA at the time um, came down, and I had. Uh, one of the – I had the top two medics from my class. Um, the uh, I had the, the top one acting as a medic and the, the number two guy acting as his grader and a narrator, and they put on a demonstration for basically their equivalent of kind of the Joint Chiefs of oh, Staff. Wow. And uh, they did a field trauma uh, demonstration, and uh, that PA walked over to me, and he said, I admit when I'm wrong. I was wrong, and he said, "If you, in your entire life, ever need a letter of recommendation for anything, I will write it wow. for you." Wow, that's awesome. That's cool. <laughs> yeah, it was it, very cool about it, and uh, it was. Uh, it, luckily, I had guys like like Jeff Pouch and, and Scotty Festa. Uh, shout out to the, those two outstanding guys uh, helping. Hello. Did we lose him? Yeah, that was really weird. Okay, maybe maybe the NSA is jamming us. Maybe I'm not supposed. That's to be probably talking. you're yeah, not maybe, supposed to be talking about that. Like, yeah, they're oh, like, oh shit. shit, he's getting ready to talk about that. Counter narcotics, South America. Yeah. We need to stop this. Need to stop this. So. <laughs> Damn NSA. You know, it's funny. There's a a, a buddy of mine who is a, a guy by the name of John Colker. He's uh-huh. a former intel analyst. Uh, he's a heart attack survivor, and he hiked the Appalachian Trail last year. But every time John and I are on the phone together, the Was calls mysteriously drop. That's really – Yeah, and our theory is that either one or both of us are still on some watch list, and we're not supposed to be talking. Well, th- thanks, Mike. Now we are. That's that's great. So now, right. yeah, you guys are known associates now, so Don't I'm worry. sorry. If they, if they check my YouTube searches, <laughs> I'm not allowed to talk to anybody. Uh. <laughs> All right. Um the fuck were we? Um, okay. Well, you know what? Can we just go? We'll just move to the next question. Okay, all right. I don't even remember. Okay, where all right. We're. I'm I'm here. Okay, all right. So, um, <laughs> all right. So, um, here we go. All right. Now, this is not a political show, right? But I do like people's personal perspectives on things. Sure. Um, based on your experiences in South America. Is the war on drugs a necessity, and is it effective? Uh, great question. So um, the there's that question's like an onion. There's a lot of layers here. Oh, so, of course, of course. Of course. 
And this um, is just personal perspective, not, yeah. you know, and it's not like a, I'm not trying to trap you into anything. It's just. Um, so specifically when, it, you know, the, the war on drugs that I was involved in, you know, specifically it was Coke. Sure. It, it it was all it was all about it wasn't about marijuana it wasn't it was it was about coke. Um, if you if people here, and and I've had this conversation with people here, you know, it's I I do think, uh, you know, I I've read literature on medicinal you know medicinal marijuana. Uh, I, I'm a firm believer in some of the great things that it can do. Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, I'm. Still waiting on enough data points to see what legalization has done in Colorado because I've heard differing opinions on that. Right. Um, I have been uh, – I, I mean I grew up in Southern California. So I've been around uh, people that smoke marijuana my entire life. Sure. Uh, not, not in the military but, you know, but growing up. Um, and – I, I still have, you know, multiple relatives who, you know, recreationally, uh, or, you know, for whatever purposes use marijuana. A lot of people are very functional. I'm a huge Joe Rogan fan and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. he is a very, very <laughs> high functioning individual. Very high who, functioning. Hell, he smokes yeah. on the podcast sometimes. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's a conversation. I, I, I wouldn't say I fall in line with Jeff Sessions when it comes to my perspective on cannabis. Sure. Um, but when I hear people say things like, well, all drugs should be legalized. Okay. So, uh, heroin, meth, cocaine, you know, tell, <laughs> tell me how any of those three things have helped somebody's life. Yeah. I would say they have yeah. not. Yeah. And, and, Given that we have to deal with the user end of that, right. I, I would tell you no. Yeah. And immediately I get there it was a victimless crime. Okay. Get on a plane with me, <laughs> fly down to South America. Let me show you six year olds who are having both feet amputated because of open sores because they have been stomping pasta, as they call it, with precursor in what they call a pozo pit uh, to make cocaine for you. Yeah. Okay. See that. See the uh, you know women tied up to trees as you know sex slaves for the guys refining coca leaves. Wow. See that. You know, see farmers who've been beheaded and tell me that that's a victimless crime. Right. Okay. For a little bit of disco dust going up somebody's nose. Are it's, you, not, you know, it's not a victimless crime. Or even in Afghanistan, the poppy fields. Yeah, the poppy fields in Afghanistan and the, yep. and the atrocities that have gone along with that. Yep. The, you know, the thing is, you know, nature abhors a vacuum and you have to, you have to be, you have to be providing alternatives. And that was... One of the things that, you know, under under Plan Columbia that we were trying to do is, you know, provide alternatives, you know, and basically it was, hey, don't grow Coke, you know, don't grow coca and, you know, use your land for something else and we're going to reward you for that. Right. But the problem is if you're doing it in the form uh, of subsidies, eventually that dries up and they're, they're just going to go back to it. You know, so you, you have to be offering, you know, vi viable and sustainable alternatives to yes, that. Sure. hundred percent. Um, you know, and we have to be, we have to be, we have to be punishing people on this end. Um, you know, I, and I, and I don't, I, I don't want to get into a conversation about whether, you know, a three strikes law is a good thing because, you know, there's there's been a lot of data to to show that it probably hasn't. Right. Um, but uh, you know, w we need to be addressing why people are doing it on this end and and what to do to keep them from doing it. One hundred percent. And we need to address you know, do people on the production end have a, another means? Because honestly, you know, the 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 probably the 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 least, uh, you know, blameworthy in this, you know, the farmers that grow these coca fields, the, they're not, you know, they're, all they know is they're growing this and some guy's coming and giving them a lot of cash and then he's taking it somewhere else. Right. Uh, that's that next level is, is where the human rights ab abuses typically start. Sure. Yeah. You know, except in cases of the farmers have been told, if you don't grow this, I'm going to cut your head off. And that does happen. Yes. Uh, you know, most people, Evo Morales was president of Bolivia, and he's a cocalero for God's sakes. I mean, this is, you know, it, uh, he also, when I was in Bolivia, he had a price on my head. Oh, wow. Um, this is not a nice person. Um, so, uh, you know, things have evolved. While, while we were kind of focused on the war on terror, 
uh, things took a pretty interesting turn uh, in in the drug world in Central and South America. Yeah, it's such but, a powder keg. Uh, yeah, I you know I think it, it's a it's a problem. It's uh it's you know the people putting coke up their nose is a, is a first world problem. Yeah. Uh, it's but it, it's causing third world repercussions. And For uh, sure. you know maybe. I, I don't I don't have good answers you know you know show show kids videos in junior high school and high school of what what's going on in Central and South America so that when they maybe get offered that drug the first time they they think about a kid with bloody feet you know or right, yeah, uh, yeah. or a, a woman that was was raped and starved to death and 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 died tied up to a tree next next to a coca refinement facility somewhere. Uh, you know, or a whole family of farmers, you know, beheaded in their front yard, and they'll think of that as opposed to being the cool kid at the party, and maybe not do it. I don't know. It's you know, that's I've I've sought my you know I I like a beer now and then I like a bottle of scotch, but sure. for the most part, I've I've sought that physical gratification outside of chemical means. Um, some people start down that path. And, uh, you know, that's, they become dependent on it. Yep. Um, yeah, definitely not something I've got all the answers to. Uh, so I don't know. <laughs> that's good. I, I like that answer. That's pretty good. Um, ooh, going back to the global war on terror, you know, what is the future of global war on terror? And do you think we're making a process, uh, the way we should be there? Uh, the, the future is, you know, People need to understand that this is uh, this is a generational conflict. It was going on for decades before 9/11 and before we stood up and realized it, and it's going to be going on for a long time. It's it's the the radical the radical jihadists, the radical imams um, who uh, preach hate. Um, and everyone their influence they have influenced you know down to you know eight uh, seven and eight year olds as long as they're still alive and perpetuating that and i'm not advocating we're going to kill in seven eight year olds that's not of what course, i'm saying of course no no, no. <laughs> but you know until they come of age and you know die in suicide bombings or die of old age or or die by uh by a, a bullet from one of us um or change themselves um that's going to continue to be a problem. So, so much generational hate has been built into them, and it's you know we talked before about the blame game about you know people here in the United States because blaming the people on the west side of I-35 for their predicament, right? Right. And uh, it, that's a lot of what goes on there is you know they're they're told you know look. You know, we we live in dirt surrounded by goat shit and the infidel lives in Las Vegas right. and, you know, <laughs> where where women walk uh, topless down the street and are allowed to drive and, and other terrible things happen. Um, and they've just they've been taught this for so long. And it's you know, it's it's it really is. a It's a blame game. It's oh, a, yeah. you know, they they Western society is decadent and they are Satan. And, uh, you know, you. You must. We, we either have to stomp them out of existence or convert them, and that's not all of Islam. I mean, there's a, a lot of people. I follow the Imam of Peace on on Twitter, and he has something enlightening and wonderful to say every day, um, and he gets death threats for it. But of course, um, yeah. yeah. How dare he speak uh, positivity in the world? Yeah. It, it, what What's going to have to happen is we need to, you know. People that have already committed down that road uh, need to be eliminated. You know, the, the the gloves are off when it comes to that. You know, you're you're willing to strap on a suicide vest, or strap it on a kid, or strap it on a woman, um, or drive a vehicle into a mall, or you know, uh, pull out a knife and start swinging into a crowd. Uh, you're a dead person. Yeah. Right. Um, you know, now the the people, you know, going to answer morning prayer who are not radicalized we need to make that we need to to provide enough counter proof 
to the propaganda that they're getting so that they know the, so that they can discount that propaganda and 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 that they'll know that it's uh, you know that's oh, that's that's just propaganda that's that's twisting the words of the prophet and that's not what we're here for um but it this, it's going to take a long time and it's not it's not something that we're going to solve with bombs and bullets alone and it's not something that we're going to we're going to solve by creating businesses overseas and handshakes and hugs alone because uh you know, some some people are beyond the handshake and hug phase. Yeah, they're they're just beyond that. And oh, absolutely. Yeah, and those are people that need to die. And uh, but what you don't want to do is in killing the people that need to die. You don't want collateral damage or things done in such a way that those people who haven't made up their mind yet because they're still impressionable. You push them into that other category, sure. And that's a lot of um, kind of the ex- the example of the wrong way to do something is uh, how the uh, how the Brits handled Northern Ireland for a long time. Oh, exactly. Is uh, yeah. they were going in and you know they said for every terrorist they locked up, they, cre- they created four more. Oh yeah. Um, and, you know the 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 IRA grew stronger all the time because uh, you know all all they saw was uh, you know. Guys, guys in 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 body armor, storming into the house next door, dragging Seamus out by his hair, and, and you know throwing him in an armored car and driving away. Right. And that that made up their minds for him. Yeah, and I think there's actually, you know, that that particular piece of history. I think um, there's a lot of lessons that we could and should learn from the way that that entire conflict was handled. Mm-hmm. You know, and but you know, on the flip side of that, and it's one of the most that's one of the, you know, awesome things about our country is our 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 constitution, right? With our speech, our freedom of speech and expression. But I do find it very interesting that basically throughout the world, regard now the methods may be different, the ideology may be different mm-hmm. as far as on the physical end of it, as far as the methods go. Mm-hmm. But I find it interesting when you look at extremes in our own country on the left and on the right. Mm-hmm. Um, I find it interesting how the principles of how the message is delivered is basically the same. Yeah. It's the same playbook. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's, yeah, it's, it's, it's it really great. Is. And I, I think that's a, I think that's an, in, that's part of the human, you know, there's an idiosyncrasy of human nature. I think that's, that's very interesting. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah. As you get, as you get to the center, as you move to the center, it's, uh, you know, Two guys with, with with opinions that differ by maybe two percent, sitting down over coffee and talking it out, and having a conversation, and you know, having right. a real conversation, uh, and, and not getting all worked up about it. And right. then as as you move to the extremes, it's people putting on masks and goggles, and you know, lobbing smoke grenades and sure. slashing people's tires, and 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 planning to do terrible things. And yep, yeah, it's uh, yep, one way or the other. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so this is this is a question that I was really interested in and wanted to know. <clears throat> How did you become involved in hunting Hitler on the History Channel? Uh, so I got involved in hunting Hitler uh, actually through Tim, through my association with Tim. Um, hmm. Tim and I uh, had had known each other for a while, but actually hadn't really uh, we we the longest period of time I think we'd ever been in the same room together was about twenty minutes. Um, but, uh, we, we moved in circles that we had, a, you know, he and I were in the same special forces group, but in different generations. Right. Um, I knew a lot of people that knew him. He knew a lot of people that knew me. Um, I worked out quite a bit at the Fort Hood fight house where Colton Smith, uh, hey. was, was in charge. And of course, you know, Tim knew Colton had cornered him multiple times. And, um, so we, so we knew each other, you know, I, I, I had his number on my phone and, uh, I followed him on Facebook and after season one, he uh, posted a Facebook post. He said, looking for somebody meets the following qualifications. And it was, you know, SF or SEAL and, you know, language, uh, some other uh, kind of higher level schools that, that, that we get to go to. And uh, I, he just said, it's for TV, I think was all he said. And uh, I texted him and I said, hey, I, I meet all those qualifications. What's going on? 
and he said, uh, email me your resume, which I did. And uh, I emailed it to him. He emailed it to the producers. They emailed me back. Um, went through a long, drawn-out uh, casting process where they wanted me. The production company wanted me. History Channel didn't. Oh, wow. Uh, his, wow. His, yeah, his, <laughs> History Channel made him look for somebody else. They actually hired a SEAL, and the SEAL couldn't do it. And then they came back to me. Um, and uh, what ended up – I was actually still on active duty. It was a few months before I retired. I had to apply for OCONUS leave. So that whole – in season two, when you see me in Spain and, and Morocco and, and everywhere, I'm actually on leave when I'm oh, shooting wow. that. Yeah. Cool. Um, but, yeah, I mean it's it was all through Tim. You know, Tim, Tim got me the hookup, and Tim, you know, put in a very, very strong word for me with them. You know, and, and assured them that, you know, he knew me, he knew my reputation, he knew I could do the work. Um, and so, you know, ultimately I, I got the job because of Tim. And uh, that's also how, obviously, how I came to work with the with Sheepdog Response because it was Tim's company to begin with. Right. Cool. So what were some of the challenges conducting what essentially is a cold case now and the process of filming that for a television show? Um the the challenges are you know as you would expect with any cold case it's 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 cold it's uh, uh, you know people have died off uh, people uh, information that some people have preserved that they might think is important is not important and then information that really could have been the key in in the in the investigation is lost to time or you know or has been been covered up. Um, those were probably the the biggest challenges, uh, and uh, as far as the the challenges, they kind of specifically apply to television. You know, there there were times that we wanted to go to an area and and be able to pick up maybe just one piece of information as it as it applied to some other known information, but uh, you you kind of have to tell the whole story revolving around that. Um, and in a lot of cases, you know, myself not being a historian, a lot of the stuff that we were seeing, you know, this, this was new to me. It might not have been new to James Holland. It might not have been new to, uh, to, to Gerard Williams, but it was new to me. Right. Um, uh, that was, that's one of the biggest complaints that I see, uh, coming back at us on, on the, uh, on the interwebs and on social media is, you know, people saying, oh, the. Everybody knew about that. That plane crash isn't, you know, it, that's not news. Everybody knew about that. You can go, that plane cl- crash. It, you can Google it. And it's like, well, yeah, there was something specifically about that that we were uncovering from a witness. But we can't, in the first five minutes of the show, look at the camera and go, all right, hey, there's a plane crash. Google it. That's what we're, that's what we're going to, you know, it's <laughs> we're we're trying to <laughs> present this in a, in a in a format. That, right, that right. for the average person who hasn't researched this, you know, they're going to be able to follow along with the story. You know, well, I think I think me, like a lot of other people, you know, this it wasn't a topic that you, <clears throat> excuse me, thought about the the what if factor. Right. You know, no, it was just I like did. the standard narrative was Hitler Hitler killed himself. Mm-hmm. See, that's what they wanted you to think. Exactly, that's what they wanted you. Yeah, to think. that was the, that was the history books. Yeah. yeah, my YouTube searches show otherwise. Hey, history's written by the victors, right? Yeah. So, um, cool. All right. So, uh, you know, besides that, going to different countries and everything like that, were there any like intense moments um, that you experienced that didn't make it into the final cut of the show? Um, just what are some things that kind of happen behind the scenes uh, from digging up, you know, all these sensitive artifacts or finding out this uh, controversial information, mm-hmm. you know, regarding Nazis and the whole finding of Hitler? Yeah, because I noticed on the show when you especially when you were in South America, mm-hmm. it oh, was yeah. like people did not want to really talk about it. Like it was still a problem. Yeah, um, there was some pretty in the in the finale of season two in shooting that. um uh, Tim and I were being followed. Um, that that didn't make it in the, into the show, but we, we by like the government or uh, no, we we had a pretty good idea of of who they were. Um, uh, it was people that were connected to the people that we were investigating. Gotcha! Um, wow, we were being followed. Uh, we knew that they knew where we were staying. Uh, we also knew. There, there were there were a couple times in the show that uh, 
you know, cause you know, so like, uh, if you think about how we shot in Spain, um, you know, I, I basically get a, a packet of information, you know, almost right. like a, almost like a target intelligence packet on, all right, well, you know, these are the, these are locations that we're going to based on the leads that we have. <clears throat> these are the people that we want you to link up with, <clears throat> see if you can either generate another lead or get, you know, what, what, get what type of information that they have. And as far as the uh, kind of nuts and bolts of the of the travel, I left the, I left that up to you know the production manager and you know the, hey this is where we're staying and this is you know this is the way that our day is going to flow and this is how we're going to get there. Um, when as we moved into Morocco, that's when things started to change a little bit. That's uh, really that's, yeah Morocco is not uh, it's I, I I would term Morocco as a little bit more semi permissive environment. Um, there's, uh, that's, it, it, it's a hub of a lot of black market activities. It's a place where yep. a lot of people coming out of North and Sub-Saharan Africa want to use as a jumping off point to make their way illegal into Europe. Um, so there's a trade going on in that. Um, it is, uh, it is an Islamic theocracy, um, that even though the prince is, is pretty, liberal by by the standards of, of Islam at the time um, were uh, I, I got some you know as as an obviously military age male who carries himself in a certain way um, my interaction with authorities uh, tended to be a little bit different and that was one of the things that the production manager even commented she said everybody immediately every place we we would get confronted a lot by uh, by law enforcement. Uh, really? uh, and it was all about, you know, I, I, I want to see your papers. I want to see your permits and, uh, you know, wow. constantly, That's it, interesting. multiple that times a day. And, um, the production manager said, she said, I've noticed every time this happens, they walk directly to you. And I said, well, I'm, hmm. I'm the oldest guy. I'm, I'm the oldest male present and also you know, probably just a little bit by my body language, they're, they're, they're kind of keying into that a little bit. Right. Um, and you know, I, and I got some, I got some looks, you know, you know, asked to show my passport and I got some stare downs and, you know, some questioning and, uh, a couple times, uh, it, it was hinted at that somebody might want to bribe and I let them know that I didn't play that. Um, wow. you know, and, and typically I'd try to push him off to the production manager. Um, Right. By the time we got to South America, it was a different game altogether, especially when we got to Chile and especially when we got to uh, Colonia Dignidad, because there were when I said, you know, this is this is the, the area where Tim and I got tailed, uh, where they knew where we were staying. And that was the time that Tim and I really had to pull the crew together and say, all right. Here, here's the deal. Here are your. We're, we're, <laughs> this just became a military. Yeah, op, we're, so we're not. We're that. not. We're not on camera talent here. This is. These are your left and right limits. These. Right. Uh, you. You know. This is how you will police up your room before we go to work every day, to not leave compromising items out. Um, this is. These are conversations we're allowed to have in public. These are conversations and words we are not allowed to have in public. Um, this is how we're going to get to and from work. This is how we're going to break down the vehicles. This is our communication plan. Um, God, so this, crazy. You know, and, and it did. It All became a military a operation. Documentary. That's um, crazy. And uh, there was a, a little bit of that almost kind of made its way on because there was a point when we kind of when we do the incursion um, into their compound. There was a, there was a point um, where where we did kind of brief everybody and they kind of filmed it for posterity purposes more than anything else, but I was kind of hoping that that would make it in there. Um, right. You know, and basically we gave everybody a contingent. We gave, we had, we had two different uh, verbal signals that we could also give during interviews. One was a, we need to casually make our way out of here. And the other one was we are walking out of here right now. Sure. Wow. Uh, so, so what, what kind of uh Outside of you know your and Tim's own planning, what other security measures did y'all have to to protect yourselves? Um, we uh, at at various points in the shoot, depending on where we were and what 
kind of had been determined the threat level was by the the companies that make you know there's companies out there that make a living doing that doing you know threat assessments of course yeah. um you know sometimes there was armed security sometimes there wasn't armed security um and sometimes that decision uh was a decision i agreed with and sometimes it was not you know sometimes i was like mm, gotcha. yeah we could have used them here um right. and you know, the uh in we had armed security in Paraguay and they showed up the first day and uh, uh, I asked the guy I said I asked the guy what he was carrying he told me and I said how many are you carrying and he looked at me he said just one and I said make sure you show up with two tomorrow I said because <laughs> because I, I said I'm not not shooting if if we need it and he said you got it yeah so of course. <laughs> he showed up with an extra gun the next day um, wow but uh, you know th thankfully it never came to that you know we we got tailed. Uh, there was some passive stuff going on. That's um, so crazy to me. It really is. That that's that the fact that after this much time, that's that you know you're you're investigating something that was like you know, 40s and 50s. You know, as far as these active networks, mm -hmm. right? That it in 2000, you know, 15, 16, 17, whatever. You, you guys are having to deal with with that. That's that's wild. Does that does that lend to the fact that are these some of these networks still active hold on a second guys i just lost you okay okay you there yeah can you still hear me okay yes. oh yeah so i i did get the question i just i thought it broke off right after that okay um gotcha i think uh i think it's a combination of things i think uh you know a lot of it is if it ever comes down to they really do a taproot deep dive in some of these organizations and they decide that you know if, if they can trace if they can trace the lineage of your wealth or the lineage of this property that you own back to that uh, you know they're going to take stuff away from you um, oh, wow and uh, you know we, we've, we've certainly seen that you know quite a bit that you know if you trace this, particular company back or whatever it might be <clears throat> that this right. was Nazi money that funded this from the beginning and it might have started out as a front company or whatever it might have been and whether or not it's sure. legitimate now you know uh, they they don't want they don't want that to get out uh, and it's you know uh, there there are people that want to shed a light on this and there are people that want it uh, want it forgotten and right something wow. that we saw in in both season two and in both in season three is that a lot of the ideology continued, a lot of atrocities continued, and whether those were occurring under a swastika or not isn't really the point. You know, it's, you know, th things were repackaged, but uh, es especially as we saw in the, in the finale of season three from what Lenny and I saw, you know, I mean, we, we uncovered that there were 754 of these camps in Chile. Yeah, which was yeah, crazy and that's, to me. Uh, some of the thing, some of the things that got edited out for time, uh, it, it could partially for time, and also we're we we try to be as sticklers as possible for for corroborating and and not just putting up what one person says, uh, you know. And and we have such loyal fans of the show that when you know something does get out there that uh, that you know the the couple of times that something might have slipped through the the cracks, they're all over it. And so, you know, yeah. we try to do our due diligence and, uh, you know, a, a couple of the, you know, the names that came up associated specifically with that final camp that we went to, that Lenny and I went to, was Walter Ralph, of course, and Klaus Barbie. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there were reports of, you know, Klaus Barbie having been there, which, you know, we typically think of him hanging out in Bolivia more, but it appears that he might have, you know, come over to Chile and basically was giving torture classes. Wow, that's just so crazy. That's just insane. Yeah, so uh, you know, he, he, hearing things like that, uh, and knowing that you know they were uh, individuals like that were allowed unfettered cross-border movement during that time frame, and and were even treated you know almost with you know celebrity status of hey you know why don't you come show us how it's done, you know and sure. and this this is how they were perpetuating it. It might not have been called uh nazism by whoever was doing it but i mean the playbook was the same you know the if, if you yeah. if you look at the it's wild uh uh if you look at the dina in, in chile it's it's the gestapo 
Pulitzer. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> you still there? Hold on, guys. I'm having technical difficulties again. You're good. We, we get it. I don't know what's going on with this. They're trying to shut, They're trying They're trying to shut, to shut us, down. us down. Now it's now it's the South American okay. Nazis. First it was the NSA. Yeah. Okay, here we go. Nope. I know. Here we go. Okay. All right. Can you guys hear me okay? All right. Yes. Oh. <laughs> All right. Yeah. That man, that is, I could literally, I could probably, I could probably talk about this topic for like ever. Be, just, but obviously for, for time constraints, we're not going to, but, um, that's just crazy, man. So did he, uh, did he escape? Did he live? You know, I, I don't. What do you think? The possibility is there. I can't. I can't say definitively when you know I you know like like Bob said at the end of the show find me a goddamn body, and that's uh, right. you know until <laughs> we we've got a lot of reports and and again there were you know we we had some some eyewitness sighting reports that never made it into the show because we couldn't corroborate you know you know there were there were people willing to tell us that they saw Hitler in South America that we were never sure. you know you know some of which you know you saw. And we're framed in such a way that, okay, yeah, this person is saying that, but um, others of which did not, um, you know, either because they had conflicting reports or you know, we, we had reason to believe that uh, somebody might just be spinning a tale or, you know, we didn't have time to corroborate it before airtime. Um, you yeah, know, sure and, and, and all the, you know, all yeah. this, you know, goes into our file and all this is at Bob's disposal. Um you know, ultimately, as you know, as, as part of the the big packet, you know, that he has. Um, but it's uh, we we couldn't find we, we didn't have the definitive proof, you know, which which ultimately was going to be, you know, the the photograph that we could verify time and place, you know, or sure. you know, even better, you know, the the body. <clears throat> we didn't have that. Yeah, I bet. But it opens the door, right, to the possibility, to the strong possibility, I think that it could have happened that he could have gotten out i mean there's no there's no real physical evidence that exists today that he was found in the bunker or anything you know there's just eyewitness testimony from yeah from the Soviet. and we you know we have of course the you have the you have the the skull and the jaw that it, and, and that's the biggest that's to me that's one of mm -hmm. the biggest pieces right there is the mm -hmm. is that skull? Yeah, and the and the the skull, of course, you know, we know it was not his. Um, right. We can't definitively prove if it was Ava or not because her her family members, surviving family members, won't cooperate for the DNA proof. Um, sure. Now you know they came out after the fact uh, and said, well, you know, the jaw. We think the jawbone and the skull might not match, so we think the jawbone is his. Um, there's a very loose, <clears throat> if you look online, there's a very, very loose interpretation of dental records that, mm -hmm. uh, uh, was done by a, a couple of different interviews. First of all, it was supposedly done from memory from Hitler's dentist who was loyal to Hitler and it was in his best interest <laughs> oh, okay. for him to say, yeah, that was Hitler's <laughs> jaw. Um, sure. uh, yeah. then there was an interpretation done later. Done from um, memory. I don't remember the year, but it, it predate. It wasn't done from what we call Panorex photos uh, or X-rays, which is really definitively how you do it. I read it, and it was uh, right. by today's standards, it would have been considered amateurish. Like it, it would not have been, it would not have met forensic muster. Um, this this right. was a dentist quite some time ago. <clears throat> uh, then it was interpreted uh, a third time by a dentist who wishes to remain anonymous. So yeah, so right away you lose all okay. credibility with me, um, right? And, you know, and these are all people that the the <laughs> Soviets have been willing to, or the, so I still call them the Soviets. The Russians have been willing to let them yeah, no, see yeah. this. <laughs> now, uh, another thing that happened uh, behind the scenes in between season two and season three is I called the Russian archives and I tried to get access to it. Uh, and and I, I'm yeah, you well, I, I got the uh, no no speaky English uh, response, which. Uh, Oh God! 
probably true, but uh, you know, but I was, you know, I was saying, you know, when can I call back that somebody might speak English? And uh, I was getting, you know, we yet. don't speak English. We <laughs> don't understand you. Uh, <laughs> we so I ended know. up contacting some people that had access to it before, uh, because there was uh, in, in season one we actually had uh, some experts on that dealt specifically with that, and the, uh, the, those individuals had also been involved in uh, another TV show that had kind of explored that original forensic evidence. So I reached out to them. Uh, and the answer that I got was the archives are so pissed off at us because we made them look like fools. They said, no one will ever see it again, especially if you're involved with American television. So it it is what it is. It's, 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 it's there. Uh, nobody's allowed to see it. So, yeah. Wow. Sort of like the Vatican. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, it's like, uh, you know, is, uh. Is St. Peter really there <laughs> in the Vatican? Yeah, right. I, I, yeah, exactly, I, don't, yeah, exactly. I think he is. <laughs> I want to believe he is. Yeah, sure. I don't know. Yeah, right. So I don't know. Yeah. You know, I don't know if there's a job so. on there or not. You know, they don't. They won't let us see it. Um, they won't do their own analysis of it in real time, uh, which would be very easy for them to do. Um, they don't want to talk about it. All right. All right. God, like I said, I go on this forever, but. Switching gears. All right. Um, tell tell us a little bit about Sheepdog Response, and um, obviously you became involved in it through through Tim, which you talked about. Um, what is your what is your role there? How do you um, what do you what do you, or essentially what do you do? I'm uh, the medical training director. So Sheepdog Response, Got it. which was uh, started by Tim and uh, and Blake Hayes, a co-founder. Um, the idea being that, you know, you know, sheepdogs, people in, in the military and law enforcement, people that are willing to, to put themselves between your average everyday person and the wolves out there that would seek to do them harm, that, you know, the, these people need skills and need training and that a lot of people would like to be better trained than they are, would like to be able to defend themselves, defend their loved ones, both armed and unarmed, sure. and that they don't know where to get the training and that there's – also, quite frankly, a lot of charlatans out there given bogus training. So, right. uh, you know, we uh, as a company wanted to provide, you know, you know, Tim and Blake, obviously, before I came on board, wanted to be able to provide that. And, uh, you know, Tim, uh, retired MMA fighter, uh, obviously, we know that his, you know, skills that he's used both in the octagon and on the battlefield uh, work. Um, and, sure. and when it comes to sling and lead, uh, you know, multiple deployments with with the SIF company in in special forces you know he definitely knows how to do it uh with with uh well armed and unarmed so uh right awesome. we have enlisted uh the most amazing instructors out there um everybody is a complete expert in their craft uh whether that's on the mats or on the range whatever it might be um and and many of them in both arenas and i was brought on board um I know I'm a I'm a I'm a fair shot. You know I could probably shoot as well, or maybe a little bit better than most SF guys. Um, probably not, you know I'm a purple belt in Brazilian Jiu Jitsu, uh, and that's and my purple belt's only two weeks old. So uh, I'm not not the oh, well, thank you not the not the greatest person on the mat. Uh, but I was primarily brought on as medical training director uh, because of my experience in combat trauma. And kind of knowing how to be a force multiplier when it comes to that, giving people the tools that they need. So if they are in a uh, traumatic situation, whether it's a natural disaster or an automobile accident or ballistic trauma in some type of mass shooter scenario, they have the tools and the knowledge to address that medical emergency and save a life. Gotcha. So I have a two-part question, okay? And, and it directly has to do with these, these – actually, I have yeah, a two-part question here that specifically has to do with law enforcement and the fact that, you know, because of your, your interaction and training um, with law enforcement, I, I think you probably have a, a decent uh, or a unique answer. Um, so given the increased threat to law enforcement in general, ambush <laughs> attacks, and the fact that law enforcement is essentially the front line in combating active terrorist events as they unfold – Mm-hmm. What is your take on the so-called, quote unquote, militarization of the police? And then there's a second part to that question, but I'll let you answer that first. Uh, I, 
I understand the concern. Right. I understand the concern. But I also understand the world in which we live. And people also need to understand that this is not the the militarization of the police. I'm making air quotes. Sure. Is not unique to the U.S. If no, you no. look at the terrorist response rollout uh, for Scotland Yard, uh, it looks a lot the same. <laughs> yeah. You know, it, it, you know, people always bring up, you know, well, you know, uh, you know, uh, police in the U.K. aren't armed. Well, no, beat cops, depending on where they are, a lot of times aren't. But when the siren goes off. Or, the, oh, yeah. you know, the page comes in, the body armor goes on, the Kevlar helmet goes on, mm-hmm. uh, you know, they're, they're, they're sporting a bullpup uh, and 210 rounds of ammunition. Right. And they're rolling up in an armored vehicle. Yeah. Okay. And, and, and by the way, they're, they're going to Hereford and they're training with the SAS in how to do what they do. Yeah. So yeah, no don't for a minute think that this is unique to the United States. Sure. Um, no, those are not. Those are not coffins that 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 FEMA camps are lining up to put people in. Uh, <laughs> people need to calm down about the you know the FEMA camps and all this stuff. Um, people need to you know take a chill pill about Jade Helm. It's just an exercise. This is you know we're not. And I think they need to stop and realize too. You know when you're especially when you're talking about Jade Helm because you're talking about the special operations community. Right. If you're ever talking about a group of guys who would not be willing to go house to house and take people's guns, that's those are the guys you're talking about. Oh sure. Uh, sure. <laughs> so uh, I I think I I understand the concern. I mean we we certainly don't want, <clears throat> you know we we don't want to wake up one day, and uh you know and live in Judge Dredge Judge Dredd's world. Oh no, hell no! Sure um, hell no! But uh, I want uh, I want everyone out there wearing the badge to go home safely to their wife and kids, or their or their husband and kids, or their dog, and or cat every night. Sure. I don't want them to have to worry about that. So if they need body armor, Travis County Sheriff, I'm talking to you. When the federal government <laughs> offers you body armor, you accept you, it. You would take it. Yep. Yeah. You take it. Okay. I don't care about your politics. You take yep. it. Yep. Uh, you know. The, yeah, you're, you're 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 using in that particular case you're talking about a political stance that literally can kill people literally can cause the death of people yeah a bad idea that's going to get Travis County Sheriff's deputies killed yeah and because, that county sued you know i don't want strings attached to the body armor that we have to you know the, that we have to take a pedophile who's an illegal alien and report him to ice Right. You know, this this is not the time to have that conversation. You know, look. No, not at look, all. Look down the line. Look at the officers who want to go home to their families every night and make sure that they have the equipment that they need. Sure. And <clears throat> do away with some of the report writing and sensitivity training. And guess what? That should be range time. You know, you we're, if you need to hire, if you need to increase the size of your department. <clears throat> by 20% in order to fulfill all of your tasks and 20% is a lot. I recognize that. Sure. And at the same time, have time for everybody to get in a workout every day, get, uh, get, uh, doing some type of unarmed combatives two to three nights a week and get to the range once a week. Then that's what you have to do. You have to look that mayor or, you know, the, the mayor or the governor or whatever it is in the eye and say, we we have to hire more people because we are spread we're spread as thin as we can to cover it but look at what we're sacrificing you know sure because that. i have them giving speeding tickets i don't have them doing this and i i almost feel like we've gotten to a point where we need to uh we need to have a breakdown of like mos's in law enforcement agree like awesome. you are only you know in, in the uk they have a traffic warden Right. Yeah. You know, right. It's some places they call them meter maids or whatever you call them. We need to have people that are your job is traffic enforcement. Your job is some, yeah, some agencies security. are like that. You know, your job is this. And we need to let you know, for, for years, there's only been two tiers. You know, you either SWAT or you're SWAT or you're not. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> um, but I think we need more tiers than that. And I think. uh you know, there and there's some room for depending on what stage in somebody's career they are in, to kind of move back and forth fluidly throughout those tiers. 
you know, depending off if they need a break or they need a challenge right. or whatever it might be. Sure. You know, they, you know, they need to be teaching at the academy for a while or, or you know, whatever. I, that would be the, the way that I would choose to. Number one, we need more. Uh, number two, I think we ought to, we ought to MOS or tier them so that, you know, people can, can specialize. And, uh, but, you know, in the end, everybody, because they're out there and, you know, even somebody writing a traffic ticket has the potential that you, you know, that person is so pissed off about getting a traffic ticket that they're just going to take a swing at you. Well, yeah, pull, pull there's, gun on. there's, yeah. And when it comes to, you know, tra hell traffic stops, some of the statistically speaking, a, a, a large percentage of violent encounters that police officers have are on traffic stops. Right. Yeah. And, you know, and, and to go to your point, you know, a lot of your, of course, major metropolitan departments um, and sheriff's offices and all that kind of stuff, they, you know, they, they do have, you know, traffic enforcement units, DWI units, gang units, you know, right. all that kind of stuff. But it's all, in a lot of ways, it's isolated to those places. Right. And so a lot of your mid-level to smaller departments that are out there, which make up the majority of law enforcement, mm -hmm. um, kind of become, everybody kind of becomes generalized in their job role. Mm -hmm. You know, they kind of take on a piece of each of it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes that, that burden, um, things get lost in that, mm -hmm. I think. And, uh, but, but no, you make, you, you make a good point. I mean, I, I can't say that I disagree with you at all. Um, the second part of that question is, um, looking at the police officers themselves mm -hmm. and the uniforms and gear that most police officers wear and carry, mm -hmm. which are very much based on old concepts. Yeah. Um, do you think they're still appropriate for the modern threat environment, even with the documented long-term health risks to wearing such a setup? Like the, it, it's been, there's been several studies on, uh, cause cops carry more gear now than they ever have mm -hmm. on their person. Yeah. And so, um, you're trying to stuff all that onto a belt <laughs> and that's sitting on your hips mm -hmm. and it's causing stress to your lower mm -hmm. back stress to you. And, 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 it, and they've shown that over a long period of time, a person that's working patrol, um, ends up having lots of lower back issues, mm -hmm. lots of hip issues, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And a general deterioration of health. Yeah. Um, when you see, when you see a cop that, um, works for a little bit, maybe a more progressive agency that, um, has, you know, maybe a load bearing vests or, or that kind of stuff is, to, do you think that's the way to go? Or do you think, um, I, I guess maybe the question is, does it really matter? Um, in, in the general grand scheme of things, if I'm providing a professional police mm -hmm. service and doing the right thing, upholding my oath, mm -hmm. um, upholding the constitution, doing the things I'm supposed to do, um, do people really care what you wear? Uh, I mean, does it, does it really matter or is the safety of the officer and the gear that he carries and, and how he's trained with it the most important thing? Um, great question, man. Um, I do. So if I had to sum this up, do you remember in the, so in the original movie, RoboCop, do you remember how the cops dressed? Not RoboCop himself, yes. but how the cops dressed. It was, it, it was yes, very, it, it, it was utility. It was like a, sure. like a one piece flight suit type thing and a vest. Right. Right. Um, and that, I mean, that screams functionality to me. And sure. I, this is actually something that I, I have thought ever because, you know, I during the time period that I was worked in corrections, I entertained the idea of you know going into law enforcement full time. And I actually did. I got hired by uh, Chatham County uh, Sheriff's Department and it got hired. And then it was actually the same week that I uh that I uh, mobilized for Desert Storm, Desert Shield, so I never worked a day with them. Oh wow! Um, but you know, if you look at you know the the core fram shoes, and you know the dress socks and the slacks, and I remember the Bullet County sheriffs. I always thought they they had them in in Georgia in the 1980s. <clears throat> most of the sheriff's departments had this had very similar uniforms. They were very sharp. There were these brown and tans. So you could wear right. uh, and and you can they were like granimals. You can mix and match, right? So you could go the brown pants and a brown top, or brown and tan <laughs> shirt, or tan bottoms and brown shirt. And they and it was orange highlights and the patch. The, the, it was a big orange star, um, and very sharp looking. 
you know, easy, easy to take care of. You sure. know, you pick them up at the dry cleaners once a week with your shi- very nice shine shoes and your belt, you know, and, you, and some guys had the shiny belt. Some guys had the weave belt. Some guys went for the standard black. Right. Some guys went, you know, for the, for the dark brown. Um, but you're right. Those belts are really heavy. And unless you're wearing the Sam Brown belt, right, that has the lanyard that puts the weight bearing on your shoulder, you're talking about mm-hmm. a lot of weight on your hips that shouldn't be on your hips. Right? Your, your hips are not meant to take that much weight. It takes the natural curve out of your lower back, causes you a lot of problems. Um, there's actually a, a nerve uh, uh, a nerve damage that's specifically called uh, deputy leg bec- oh be- for God. that reason. Yeah, that's it, interesting. It's, and I'd okay, have to look yeah. up which nerve it is, but it's from basically wearing, wearing a holster and having it push in a particular spot all the time. So mm-hmm. I, I think a little bit of it, I think depends on, you know, what, what their individual duties are, but, uh, sure. it, it, it's, it's, a, it's a, it's complex. It's another onion question again, because on one hand, I would like to see us get back to community policing where, where the, where yeah, the guy who is going to, the guy who's going to be at my door to ask me if my son blew up that mailbox is the guy who I see at the HEB and who lives just around the corner from me. And he already knows sure. it was my son that blew up the mailbox. Right. Right. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and, and we're going to, we're going to plan out how we're going to take care of that. So, you know, you know, that guy, you, you kind of don't, obviously you don't want to open the door and see a guy in, you know, in full kit with a, with a, with a speed sling with his, you know, his M4 on a speed sling. Sure. Yeah. So, no, not at but, all. But no. at the same time, you know, I, I want, I want for the officers out there to have equipment that protects them, equipment that is going to give them longevity, uh, that they're going to be able to engage in pursuit or engage in retreat or, you know, climb a fence or crawl through something if they need to and do that in a functional manner. And honestly, I would rather, I would rather see functional fatigue type uniforms that are comfortable and they can do those things Mm -hmm. in, you know, as long as they don't have big, you know, gaping rip holes in them as, as opposed to, uh, you know, a, a, a badge that was freshly brassoed that morning and crisp military (laughs) creases on their shirt and trousers. Um, yeah, I I do think, I mean, it's, and it depends for the area. If, if you're talking about, uh, a, a very rural <clears throat> police force that's made up of maybe four individuals and, uh, you know, you know, sleepy little town, uh, it, it might be a little bit more, you know, the, the nice pressed, you know, and everything else is in the trunk. But in a metropolitan area where it's a dynamic threat and at any given moment mm-hmm. you can go from zero to scaling a fire escape or a fence – I think it needs to be more functional, you know, from the, from the footwear on up. Right. I agree. Like I, I look at it like, um, you know, in, in when I, when I sometimes it, it, I don't know if I have more of a radical view. I, I probably do when it comes to the majority of, of my counterparts, but I, I look at it like this. I look at it like if you have a uniform, like you're talking about, even if it's, even if it's the you're still doing the, the the polyesters or whatever, but the cargo pockets and all that kind of stuff, it to me if you're taking that weight off the off the uh, off the hips, right? You're putting it up on a vest, mm-hmm. and obviously that outer vest is going to be you're going it's going to add to your flexibility as opposed to having a vest under the shirt that's tucked in and mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, you're talking about increased comfort, and then but having it capable to where if the quote unquote shit mm-hmm. hits the fan. You can then accessorize that by throwing on a, a helmet, throwing on your M4, mm-hmm. whatever, you know. Oh, um, and, and I think that, you know, we, we, we get, a, I think there's a lot of pushback, right, in the perception of things. Mm-hmm. I just feel like the majority of people that you're, that you deal with, if you're providing that professional police mm-hmm. service and you're doing all the right things, that most of those people want you to be protected. They want you to have the gear. They want you because they know that, you know, hey, if this guy's responding to my call, Frank, I need help. I, I want to make I want him to have everything that he needs to help me. Right. And and sometimes I think that gets lost 
in the whole community oriented policing thing um, because we don't want to offend anybody. But does that does that make sense to you? No, it absolutely makes sense. And to me, if, if I had, if if I had to make one change to to what I'm carrying, uh, and this of course this is my soapbox, is every officer needs to have a properly outfitted individual first aid kit, and and they need to have a tourniquet. And uh, you know, if that's the only yes, change that I can affect, I would I would be happy. And I yeah, absolutely. So. Um, we're gonna we're gonna jump into a lightning round of questions real quick. Okay. These are these are kind of the final questions. Um, there, there's there's a few of them, but we just uh, just kind of give people a general broad sense of how you are. Okay. Okay. All right. Okay. If you could go back in time and meet the twenty year old version of you, what advice, if any, would you give him? Start taking jujitsu right now. Awesome. There you go. Good advice. Awesome. <laughs> okay. All right. Are there any books or movies that have had an impact on your life for the better? Uh, yeah. So, um, the book that has impacted me, uh, I, I don't know if I'd say the most starship troopers is the book. I think I've, I've read the most times, <laughs> uh, just because I identify with, you know, the fact that he, uh, kind of describes his journey in, you know, going through basic training and, uh, and, and, and advanced training as a mobile infantryman and everything else. And the movie didn't do justice to the book, obviously, but obviously yeah but, uh but starship troopers is a is a is a book there, there's been several of them out there but that's always the one that kind of pops to mind right away um so uh movies that have made an impact on my life um one of my all-time favorite movies is uh a knight's tale with uh with heath ledger Martin, oh, heath. um just because it, it represents you know a, a boy who came from nothing and kind of embraced the warrior spirit, you know, he, he embraced knighthood and, uh, you know, and, and excelled in single combat and in that way made a name for himself and, and ultimately was recognized as an equal, uh, at the end of the movie, of course, b uh, by others. So, uh, and plus there's just great music in that movie. So I love it. Awesome. Gotcha. Um, so and you may have already done this. I don't know. Tell me if you have. But um, if you were invited to speak at a graduation of high school or college students, mm -hmm. what advice would you give them? I would say try to be a better version of yourself every day. Um, learn from your mistakes, but don't let them define you. Right. Um, and don't listen to the don't listen to the the people that tell you you can't do something uh, because you can. It's, uh, you know, I, obviously there's certain things, you know, I'm never going to play in the NBA. I'm never going to play in the NFL. Um, right. That was never going to happen. But uh, there, there are ways to make your dreams come true. And, uh, you know, and I would also say don't ever look at any point in your life and say, well, this just is my life. This is, this is, this is where I am because – uh, my life has radically evolved and changed multiple times, uh, even even through my my late 40s. You know, I I just I just turned 52, yeah. and uh, the the leg of the journey that I'm on now with uh, Sheepdog Response and uh, with uh, some other uh, companies who are doing great things who are talking to me about coming on board with them and with. Uh, some of the possible uh, television opportunities I might have coming up in the future, you know, this is a, a whole new aspect of my life. You know, I've, you know, I, I had the ranger aspect of my life, the, what I thought was going to be the law enforcement aspect of my life that, you know, that changed and went into SF, then the physician aspect of my life. And now I have this kind of strange uh, sheepdog, uh, semi-public figure, E-list celebrity thing going on uh it's like even that. different so and, and five ten years from now it could be totally different from that so yeah that, that's sure. the big thing i would tell them too is don't ever look at any point in your life and say this is it from here on out because it's it's going to change now changing gears now you're you're invited to speak before a graduation of police ca police academy cadets mm -hmm. what advice do you give them wow uh first i would thank them for even even volunteering to, to embark on that journey because it, it is such an immense responsibility and it, it takes a special, special breed of person to do that. Um, I would say, don't let, 
don't take the bad stuff you're going to see every day home. Because you're, you're yeah. going to see bad stuff. I don't care what department you work for. You're going to see terrible stuff every day. And don't, don't take that home and don't, don't sink to that level. Um, mm. And like that. <clears throat> remember the way you feel right now about why you're doing this and why you think it's important. When you are at your absolute worst moment, I want you to reflect back on this moment because – that's going to be a wake-up call. When, when, when you start to get off track and either become complacent uh, or become jaded or whatever it might be, when you think back to this moment, when you think of this, the smiling cadet on graduation day, I want you to be this person again. And that, that's what's going to give you longevity and, and make it home every night. I like that. I like that. I'm going to take that. I'm stealing that. You <laughs> if got I it. get asked to speak, I'm stealing that, dude. So if you were to, if you were approached to write an autobiography about your life up to this point, what would it be titled and why? Uh, so I kind of toyed with the idea of, of writing an autobiography and I, I, I kind of started an outline a couple of years ago and I was actually going to call it, uh, the oath. Um, I like because, that. uh, I thought that really everything uh, revolves around the, you know, the oath of enlistment that I took when I raised my right hand for the very first time uh, and, and got on that bus. And uh, that oath has never expired. You know, e- even though my, uh, my enlistment has expired and I'm retired now, that oath has never expired. So everything really comes back to the oath. So that's, that's what, I, was gonna, that's what sure. I planned on calling it. All right, if, if they were going to turn that book into a major motion picture, who would play you? So it's been the subject <laughs> of some debate with my wife and I. So, oh, so, really? Uh, okay. The, uh, who's the guy on Homeland? He's actually British. The, he's a ginger. I know who you're talking about. Uh, yeah, so my, my wife swears he can play me, and uh, I, I don't see any way that that's possible because <laughs> he's way too tall and way too skinny. He's so, very skinny. Uh, I have always said it's a toss-up uh, between um, – Frank Grillo and Sullivan Stapleton. Interesting. Yeah. So, uh, and actually, so I actually tweeted out one time a picture of me uh, in uh, in Afghanistan, my first tour in Afghanistan. And at the time, I'd just taken my helmet off and my hair like is, is going like way up. My yeah. hair was pretty long at the time. Kind of like Frank Grillo's hair, actually. And I said, yeah, I said, uh, I said, here's a picture of me from Afghanistan. If they ever make a movie, I either want... Uh, Sullivan Staple turned to Frank Grillo to pray me and Frank Grillo actually replied to it and no said, kidding. that's and funny. Said, he said, pick me, bro. <laughs> so <laughs> I guess he, tec- he probably doesn't even remember that, but I technically he's got first dibs. <laughs> All right. That dude's name is Damian Lewis, by the way. Damian Lewis. Yes. Yeah. He played uh, Dick Winters in Band of Brothers. He did play Dick Winters. Yeah, in Band of Brothers. That was one awesome. of my all time favorite roles. Yeah. And Grillo was awesome in uh warrior. Yeah. Yeah. Grillo's awesome in just about everything. Yeah, that's true. Um, where, um, let's see, how do you find motivation to keep on when things are not going well and you just want to quit? Uh, from my wife, mostly that's, uh, she, uh, she's my, my, my harshest critic, but she's my biggest cheerleader. Yeah. Um, when things aren't going well and I, and I, and I want to wallow in self pity, she's always the one who gives me a wake up call. And pulls me out of that. And so, ironically enough, she has a she has a PhD in leadership studies, and she's a life and leadership coach. Oh wow! Um, but she doesn't approach me like she does her normal coaching clients. Sure. Uh, she's a, a a little bit more direct with me, I think, because she knows she can be. But <laughs> yeah. I uh, I was actually uh, on a sat phone call with her um, from a remote location around the world. And I was having some issues with some of the people that I was working with and the working situation that I found myself in. And I was basically being a whiny bitch about it. And <laughs> this was my, my weekly phone call so that I could whine. And she said, is any of what you described putting, putting you in imminent danger of death? And I said, no. She said, then shut the fuck up. Wow. Well, God, sounds and, like and then I was that like, well, like yeah, okay. 
Yeah. It's, does, I mean, it I, work? And, and it made me realize I was just, I was whining about stupid stuff. And, uh, actually, uh, right after that, the, the week that followed was one of the, uh, if I had to narrow down a week that was my best week in my military career, uh, that was the week that immediately followed. I don't know if it was, uh, I mean, a little bit of it's happenstance, obviously, because my wife telling me to suck it up is not what affects op tempo, but, uh, right. right. But, uh, yeah, so I, that's, uh, you know, I, in this phase of my life, I turn to my wife and in, uh, previously in my life, you know, I've, I've turned within and said, you know, this, this, the same thing I told you guys at the beginning, you know, that I have to be the person that can look himself in the mirror. So, uh, how yeah. am I going to look myself in the mirror if, if I let this defeat me and, uh, right. you know, sure. am I willing to accept defeat and, or, you know, do it or, you know, do I go out on my shield knowing that I gave it my all? Yeah, basically. For sure. All right. So last question, if people want to learn more about you or get in touch with you, where can they find you? Uh, so a uh, couple different ways to do that. So, uh, if you, if, if you want to, uh, if you want to see the ugly side of me, you follow me on Twitter. <laughs> That's uh, at Dr. Mike Simpson, D-R-M-I-K-E-S-I-M-P-S-O-N. Uh, I have the same handle on Instagram, and that's a little bit more light and cheery. Um, uh, I also have a public uh, Facebook page that's Dr. Mike Simpson spelled all the way out. Uh, if you want to contact me, you can contact me if you, if you if you're listening to the podcast. The email address is in there. It's uh, it's Hoplon Medical H O P L O N Medical at uh, Gmail, um, or you can go through the uh, Sheepdog Response page if you go to SheepdogResponse.com and click contact and just put <clears throat> in the in the subject line that this is this is for me and it'll get it'll get to me. Cool. And, real and there's quick, also there's also a bio on there if you want to learn a little bit more about me. Gotcha. So real quick, just if there's any projects you got upcoming that you want to advertise or plug, now's now's the time to do it. Um, I'm going to be uh, in Phoenix uh, next AZ. week, Monday and Tuesday, teaching a Spectrum of Tactical Emergency Care course. And then uh, the third week in um, April, I'll be in Oklahoma City. Uh, teaching the same course and then folding right into, I'll actually be sticking around for the regular sheepdog, the sheepdog law enforcement course and the sheepdog civilian course up there. So getting some range time in and getting some mat time in. So I'm looking nice forward to that. Um, those are coming up. Uh, I've got a couple of TV things that I can't talk about yet because nobody's bought off on them. So sure. we'll, cool. we'll see how, how, how that's going to go. I'm going to be uh, at the Special Operations Medical Association Conference in Charlotte, uh, hanging out there, which is in April. Um, so I'll be doing that. Uh, and that's pretty much it. That and uh, I'm a little bit behind on podcasting right now. But of course, you know, the Sheepdog Project on iTunes, Stitcher, Podbay and everywhere else. Got cool. you. Got awesome. It. Well, Mike, man, we really appreciate you coming on the podcast. It was awesome, awesome to talk to you. Um, you're an awesome guy, and thank you, sir. We yeah, appreciate we really it. appreciate it. Well, thanks for having me on, man. I really appreciate it. This uh, this was a lot of fun. Hope we can do it again sometime. Absolutely, yes, absolutely. absolutely. Just let us know. All right, man. Bye. So, Big Bo. Yes, sir. That was pretty awesome. That was awesome, Mike Simpson. Yes, sir. Amazing dude. Yeah. Amazing story. Me and that dude are gonna have to roll one day. I'm pretty sure I can take him. You think you can take him? Yeah, no, I'm pretty sure. I don't think you can. No, I'm pretty sure. He's purple belt jiu-jitsu. I don't, that doesn't mean anything to me. It will. It won't. Uh, all right. Okay, cool. I've won combative tournaments before. Oh, <laughs> well, good luck to you. Good luck. I, you know, if you beat if you beat Mike Simpson, then you get, to, you get to roll with Tim Kennedy. Then I'm beating Mike Simpson. Oh, God. No, you're not beating Mike Simpson. Um, all Are right. we doing points? Or is this just is this just an all out combatives tournament? Or is this just he's just are we standing up? It doesn't really matter. I just want to know what he's the best at so I can take him down in that. I'm pretty sure he's a totally pur- joking. I'm, I'm pretty totally sure he's a purple belt in jujitsu. He's going to. I'm totally joking, but I'm going to beat him. Though. And he's and he's a green beret. So good luck to you. Um, I wasn't listen. I was yes. listen. Yes. I was in the military too. I don't know if you know that. <laughs> I, was in the, I was in the military like, as well. I was well. in the military. I was in the military as well. <laughs> I don't know if you know these things about me, but I was totally in the military. All right. Why don't you? Uh, why I went you... to boot camp too. All, All right. right. Moving on from that nonsense. <clears throat> um, 
why don't you tell people where they can uh, where they can find us and how they can support us? I'll tell you where they can find us at. Do it. They can find us at Instagram at streetwarriorradio.com, Twitter at str the ward. Well, finish spelling it. Go ahead. What is it? S T R T, the word warrior. Uh huh. R D I O. I I need to learn that Twitter thing. That's so. Facebook streetwarriorradio.com, the interwebs. Uh, streetwarriorradio.com Facebook is Street Warrior Radio YouTube iTunes iHeartRadio Google Play Stitcher and TuneIn Submit your questions and comments your war stories to streetwarriorradio.com uh, Contact us at info at streetwarriorradio.com and or jc at streetwarriorradio.com Big Bo B-I-G-B-O not D-O but B-O B as in boy at streetwarriorradio.com Um and Amazon click through. Make sure you're going to that on the website, streetwarriorradio.com. And Big Bo's out. And with that, I want to give our gratitude and thanks to the men and women of our armed forces, the sacrifices that they make to keep us free and to make our lives possible here in this beautiful republic. To our first responder, brethren, police, fire, paramedics, we appreciate everything you do. Keeping us safe here at home. Go out there every day. Be safe uphold your oath and to the families of our military and law enforcement and other first responders we appreciate the sacrifices that you make it is noted and i don't think you guys are appreciated enough and to everyone else out there that makes the world go around we love you appreciate you to our followers and supporters thank you so much for everything Um, again if you have any questions comments concerns war stories you can get us at streetwarriorradio.com slash contact or on that email at info at streetwarriorradio.com Dot com. And with that, Street Warrior Radio is out of service.